Okay, correct question. So let's start off with the Mangalacharan prayers. <clears throat> Om Jnanuti Mirandhasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamsya Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raguna Tam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitan Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamsya He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpata Rubhyasya Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna So let's take a beautiful flower we'll offer at the lotus feet of Shri Prabhupada Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Preshtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamin Itinamine Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pashatya Deshatarine We look for obeisances to Sri Bhagavatam. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Sarva Shastra Vipyusha, Sarva Vedeka Sattala, Sarva Siddhanta Ratnyadhyaya, Sarva Lokeka Drikpada, Sarva Bhagavata Prana, Shriman Bhagavato Prabhu, Kali Dvanto Ditaditya, Shri Krishna Parivartita, Parmananda Pathaya, Prema Varsha Aksharaya, Te Sarvada Sarva Sevaya Shri Krishnaya Namostute Mad Eka Bandhu Mad Sangin Mad Guru Man Mahalana Man Nishtarka Man Bhagya Mad Ananda Namostute Asadu Sadu Tadain Ati Nicho Chatakara Hana Muncha Kadatin Ma Prema Ritkanta Yospuraha Narayan Namaskrityam Naranchaiva Narotamam Devim Saraswati Vyasam Tato Jai Mudire Nashta Praishu Abhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttamas Loke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtiki Srinvatam Swakatha Krishna Punya Shravana Kirtana Ridenta Stavadrani Vidunoti Surit Satam Grantra Shriman Bhagavatam Ki Hare Krishna. So, welcome back. Nice to see all of you. I uh, have to apologize for my absence for a few weeks. Uh, somehow, I had planned that maybe in India I could possibly take two sessions, but just with the either technical aspect of just the internet and then just uh, with the travels, it did not work out. But um, I apologize for uh, missing the sessions, but now we will get back to our regular sessions and continue for the session. So I also know that while I was in India, so uh, there were three sessions where you had reading and discussion. Vijaya Mataji led one discussion and then Gopinath Prima Pratna Mataji, they led two of the discussions. So <clears throat> the way I'm thinking we'll do it, uh, is, uh, I was talking to uh, Gopinath Jai Prabhu and he said we have covered up to text 30, but I will uh, 
kind of review starting from text one and uh, and some places maybe i'll just put for the question and then you can share your uh, understanding and if that's you know if something more is needed i'll just add on, on that okay so with that uh, we will start um let's see should i get right into the maybe uh, we'll take realization a little bit later let's get right into the chapter okay so we are discussing chapter 15 okay. chapter 15 of the uh, shrimad bhagavata so just a quick review of chapter 14 so in chapter 14 we saw that how yudhishthira maharaj he saw all these bad omens like arjun had gone to dwarka it was few months since he's gone he did not get any news of Arjun, there was no Facebook, Twitter, and all these things, and he was thinking, okay, where is Arjun, and what's happening? And at the same time, he was observing inauspicious moments, right? And then when he was observing all these inauspicious moments, and he was thinking, Arjun has gone for a long time, and all these inauspicious moments are occurring. And then he talked to his, uh, he uh, shared his, uh, uh, what he was seeing with his brother Bhima, and he said, this is all happening, you know, and he's concerned about Arjun. And then when he expresses his concern, then Arjun comes in. And when Arjun comes in, he himself is kind of dejected, his head is down and he's uh, crying. And that further confirms Yudhishthira Maharaj that something very inauspicious has happened. Right? And then he actually, uh, you know, because of the love of the Pandavas for Krishna, so though uh, twice, one Narad Muni had indicated, and second, Vidura had indicated that, oh, it's time for Krishna to wind up his path. And so in spite of hearing twice the hints that, oh, maybe Krishna would have left, he actually did not directly come to that question of, is Krishna you know, still here? Like he actually had some kind of speculative inquiries. Oh, is this happened? Or maybe like, you know, first he starts off by saying that uh, he asked about the uh, welfare of different personalities in Dwarka, and then he actually talk, talks about Lord Shri Krishna, where the Lord Shri Krishna is actually in, in the assembly of Dwarka, where everything is going well. And then he comes to Arjun and he says, Arjun, maybe are you not happy because you did not give charity at the right time or you couldn't protect women? And he gives all these speculative inquiries. Right? And the chapter ends, chapter 14 ends, with finally Yudhishthira Maharaj coming to, is it because you know, Krishna has been Right. So that was overview of chapter 14. And then now in chapter 15, we will uh, go ahead with chapter 15. Okay. So since you have read the uh, Sanskrit and the purports up to text 30, we will actually just do the English translations uh, just uh, for the sake of time. So um, we have the list there. So maybe uh, we can just read English translations. So starting with Arundhati Mataji and then the list is on the chat. So just read the uh, just English translation. So text one. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Shall I start? Yes, please. Yeah. Next one. Uta Goswami said, Arjuna, the celebrated friend of Lord Krishna, was grief stricken because of his strong feelings of separation from Krishna over and above all Maharaja Yudhishthira's speculative inquiries. Go ahead, Prabhuji. No, go ahead, Mathilde. You're saying something? I don't know. Shall I read one more or just... No, no. Uh, we'll go one by one, Mathilde. I'll also point out the important Sanskrit words in the shloka. So, <laughs> in this uh, sans, uh, first shloka, the important word is vikalpitaha. Vikalpitaha means speculative. Right? So, what Yudhishthira Maharaj was actually inquiring was all his speculation. Right? And one may say that Yudhishthira Maharaj, he is dharmarat. Right? And we see like how he does not speak lie and all the glorious qualities of Yudhishthira Maharaj. Why would he speculate? Right? Why would Yudhishthira Maharaj speculate? That's such a uh, personality that everything he says is actually truth. Why would he speculate? The only answer to that is because he did not, because of his love for Lord Sri Krishna, he did not want to come to the point that, oh, maybe Krishna has it. Right? And you can practically experience also, you know, with our own relatives when, you know, uh, you are old or you hear some bad news and if you have not heard it fully then immediately the mind goes maybe it is this but you know the mind wants to not think of oh maybe that relative has left you know? so similarly Yudhishthira Maharaj because of his deep love for Lord Sri Krishna he actually was speculating and that was basically the previous time okay then proceed text two <laughs> 
Due to the grief, Arjuna's mouth and lotus-like heart had dried up. Therefore, his body lost all luster. Now, remembering the Supreme Lord, he could hardly utter a word in reply. Hmm. So, when Musa Maharaj in the previous chapter, he asked Arjun, is it that Krishna has not departed? But Arjun's situation is now described. And when you read about this Arjun's situation, it reminds us of Bhagavad Gita at the end of first chapter where Arjun, because of the, you know, at the start of the battle of Kurukshetra, and his mouth was drying, his hairs were standing on end, and he's, he was crying, you know. So one way we can uh, see like similar situation, uh, similar symptoms have been described. So what are the different signs of lamentation? One is says his mouth was drying up, right? And this is similar in Bhagavad Gita also, we read this, mouth drying up. Then the second one, a nice word is Rit Sarojaha. Rit means heart. Sarojaha means lotus. So it's described Arjun. It's not just said his heart was drying up. It just says his lotus-like heart, right? And that actually further describes that how Arjun who is so, like even in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna makes the point that Arjun is so soft-hearted that in spite of all the atrocities that the Kauravas did, he was actually willing to forgive everyone. Right? And that shows the symptom of a Vaishnava. That shows the symptom. So here we see Arjun, he is particularly the word is used that lotus-like heart because it says like if someone is so soft-hearted and then when there is something bad, then the emotions are so much more intensified, right? So, lotus like that. Then his bodily luster, luster was, you know, was going away. And then Anusmaran, the word Anusmaran is used, that he was thinking within, right, about Lord Shri Krishna. And because of that, you know, feeling of lamentation, he could not speak. He could not give a response to Yudhishthira Mahara's question. Okay, S3. With great difficulty, he checked the tears of grief that smeared his eyes. He was very distressed because Lord Krishna was out of his sight and he increasingly felt affection for him. Hmm. So, Krishna Panina. So, he said, with great difficulty. So, imagine Arjun's situation. His most intimate friend, his most intimate friend has now departed. And that's Arjun who is so soft hearted, the lotus like heart. Tears are flowing from his eyes, but he's trying to check those tears of grief. And then he was very distressed. And the word that's beautiful, that's there, Sanskrit is pranaya utkantya. Right? Pranaya utkantya means he was eagerly thinking of that intimate love with Krishna. And then he says samunadha. Samunadha means that love was increasing at every moment. You know, and that is the nature of spiritual love. That when we are absorbed in thoughts of Krishna, that absorption, because it is spiritual, it's transcendental, that is like an ocean that keeps increasing and increasing. Right? So, so those words are used, pranaya or kantya, samunada. So like an ocean, it is uh, eagerly he was thinking of that affection to Krishna and that was increasing like an ever-increasing ocean. Okay, text number four. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Translation. Is it Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai? Remembering Lord Krishna and his well wishes, benefactions, intimate, familial uh, relations, and his chariot driving Arjun. Never well and breathing very heavily, begin to speak. Dhanvat <coughs> Pranam uh, Prabhuji, I have my laser surgery, so. No, it's okay if you don't read, Mataji. Okay. Hare Krishna. Thank you for joining. So, <clears throat> text number four says Remembering Lord Sri Krishna, and particularly now, the words are very nice Sakyam, Maitrim, Sauridam. And how Bhagavatam is so beautiful that it's talking of three kinds of friendship that Krishna had with Arjun. Right? So first is Sakyam. So Chakravarti Pad is explaining. Sakyam means like when friendship is just based on like mutual affection. Okay, just based on mutual. And then when I explain the other two, even the Sakyam will be more people. So Sakyam, you can just now consider 
that friendship just based on mutual affection. Then second one, maitrim. Maitrim is that friendship, but it is mixed with dasya or the mood of serving. And you know, we may have such relationship that yes, he's a friend, but one may consider whenever we have that intimate uh, reeling of friendship, our mood is more of like, how can I serve? You know, how can I serve him? Right? And the third one is sour rhythm. Sour rhythm is friendship, but it is mixed with vatsavi. Means more friendship with the mood of caring. That when we meet that friend, we are always thinking that, oh, is he doing well? You know, how can I take care of him? What will be the best for him? So like, like that vatsalya, like that mood of care and parental, that affection. Right? So here it says, sakhyam maitrim sauridam cha. So all these three feelings, whether it's just mutual affection, whether it's friendship with dasya or friendship with sakya, all these three relationships were there between Krishna and Prabhu. Right? And what is the examples one can think of this? So the first one, Sakyam, is very easy. Like, you know, we see in Bhagavad Gita also, in the 11th chapter, Krishna talks about it. And in this chapter also, further we'll see how the intimate relationship between Krishna and Arjuna is mentioned, that how they used to sit together, they used to sleep on the same bed, they used to have food together, right? And also sometimes, like, because there was Kshatriya, sometimes Arjuna used to chastise Krishna, like, right? speak sarcastic words to Krishna. So that intimate friendship, so that relationship was Sakya. Then if you consider Maitri, it is Sakya mixed with Dasya. Right? So what is the example that comes to our mind? Like the perfect example is how Krishna took the role of a chariot driver for Arjuna. So if you consider in the battlefield of Kurukshetra, it was Arjuna giving instructions, saying, go here, do this. Now, you know, and you can imagine like it is said that in this, uh, when they have this fight, the chariot driver plays an important role in the success of the, the main uh, fighter, right? So Krishna was, Arjun was telling Krishna, oh, do this, go this, do here, go here, right? So in that mood, so that relationship was, uh, Krishna was having that mood of, yes, friendship, but he's taking the role for service, having that mood of service. That's it. And the sauradam is a friendship which is mixed with vatsalya. So this one can consider that, you know, we can see the relationship between Krishna and Arjun, that Krishna was always concerned for Arjun. Right? He was always thinking of what is the best for Arjun. So though he was taking the position of a servant, he was acting as a, as a messenger, he was actually playing menial position, right? He was taking a menial role, but yet at the same time, he was always... Uh, like the benefactor who was always thinking for the best of Arjun, right? So in that way, those three relationships are there. Right? Okay, so here saying, uh, remembering Lord Shri Krishna. So Arjun was uh, thinking about Krishna and then the words are used that it says, Gad Gadaya. So even this is there in Bhagavad Gita. Gad Gadaya means overwhelm, right? And then Bhaspa, heavily breathing. That was the symptoms of Arjun. He was overwhelmed with anxiety. He was heavily breathing. And then we read previously how he was, uh, tears were coming, but he was trying to uh, control his tears. And, uh, you know, he was feeling so much distress and so on. Right? Um, yeah. So Prabhupada in the purport points out that how Krishna is always, is perfect in all the relationships. Right? Prabhupada uh, is, uh, you know, taking this to the point that how, yes, we know when we consider uh, Krishna's Sakya relationship, the first example that comes to our mind is Arjun. Right? And, but in that relationship, how that all the three varieties of friendship were there in that relationship shows how Krishna is so perfect in all his relationships. Right? So uh, Prabhupada says, the dealings between Krishna and Arjun displays friendship of the highest perfect order. So he was not only the well-wisher, he was benefactor, and he protected Arjun in different cases, but also he took menial services to actually uh, intensify that relationship of friendship. Okay. Okay. So now, so this is basically Arjun, uh, the strong feeling describes the first section, which is strong feeling of separation from Lord Sri Krishna. Now, second is where Arjun is actually remembering all those intimate intimate dealings with Krishna, right? And it's very natural 
like you know when you're feeling separation from anyone right? so immediately you think about oh when he was there i did this and then we used to go here we went to the park together we took a walk and we went to a drive we, we ate ice cream together whatever you know we remember all those intimate dealings so now arjun because he's feeling that intense separation which we read in these verses he's actually thinking about all the intimate dealings with uh, krishna right so the next section is going to describe all those intimate um, incidents you know that uh, arjun is having Okay, so any comments up to this point? Go to section number two. Everyone okay? Yeah? Yes? Okay. Okay, so let's proceed. <clears throat> text number five. Hare Krishna, Sri Krishna. Yes. Text five translation Arjuna said, O King, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Hari, who treated me exactly like an intimate friend, has left me alone. Thus, my astounding power, which astonished even the demigods, is no longer with me. Hare Krishna. Okay, so <clears throat> so beautiful purport Prabhupada gives to this. So now Arjun is directly giving an answer to Yudhishthira Maharaj's question. So in chapter 14, the last word, Yudhishthira Mah Maharaj is finally asked Arjun and he said, he uh, directly asked about Lord Krishna, are you feeling, are you, dis uh, are you distressed because you have lost your most intimate friend? And now directly Arjun replies, and he says, O King, the Supreme Personality of God, that Hari, uh, who actually treats me, Bandhu Rupina, Bandhu Rupina means like a most intimate friend, right? Now, he is actually Vanchitaha. He has actually left me now. That Krishna, who is my most intimate friend, who is my Bandhu, who is actually now gone and left me. And then when Krishna has left, the second part of this verse is actually saying, Aparatam, I have be become bereft. Of what? Tejaha. And that power which Deva Vishmapana, that was astonishing to all the demigods. So Arjuna is saying, yes, Krishna has departed my most intimate friend. And further he's saying that now when Krishna has gone, my most astounding power, that power which is actually astonish even the demigods, that power has also left with Krishna. Right? So Prabhupada elaborates on this point. And uh, first of all, he says, like the first point in the purport Prabhupada says, a very powerful purport. So first point, uh, Prabhupada quotes, yad yad vibhuti matsatvam shriman urjitam evava tat tat eva vagachatam mama tejo amsa sambhava. Then uh, chapter Bhagavad Gita, text 41, right? Where uh, Krishna is actually, after describing all the vibhutis, you know, in the 10th chapter, we describe, we read the different vibhutis that Krishna says. At the end of the, all the vibhutis, what does Krishna say? Yad yad vibhuti mat sattva. Right? All these vibhutis that I have described, he says, mama tejo amsa. They are all just a spark of my splendor. Right? So Prabhupada actually quotes this verse and he actually says that whenever we see any power, any beauty, any strength, any wealth, you know, any of these qualities we see, we should understand that all this is just a spark of Krishna's plan. And this is how we stay Krishna conscious. Right? We may see someone very opulent and say, oh, that's just a spark of Krishna. How glorious my Krishna must be. Right? He has some qualities, but my Krishna is infinitely more uh, has more quality. Right? So, so that's one way like we can always uh, remember Krishna, we can always be Krishna conscious. Is any glory, we see the beautiful nature and say, oh, this nature, beautiful sunrise, but this is just a spark of Krishna's glory. Right? And, uh, yeah. and then the other thing we can always say, if a person is, uh, is showing like he has a lot of wealth or beauty, then we can say that this is actually Krishna's glory is visible through that particular person, right? So both the points are there. One is we see 
Everything is just as part of Krishna's splendor. And second, we say Krishna has endowed that person with a particular quality. You know, strength, beauty, faint, and so on. So, okay, so that's the first point. The second point Prabhupada explains is when the Lord descends, he actually displays his divine power. Right? How Krishna married 16,100 right queens, and then uh, he had 16,100 right palaces, and then all his amazing pastimes, lifting Govardhan hair on his little finger. He displays divine power. Right? And the second thing, he actually empowers the devotees who actually come with him right, to fulfill the mission for which he is sent. So the first is he actually shows his own power, and second he empowers devotees. Right. So particularly here, he uh, when Arjun says that oh, when Krishna left, I have been bereft of all my power. That means that uh, when Arjun came with Krishna, Krishna empowered him with the power so that his particular mission can be fulfilled. So this actually um, in the uh, <clears throat> In uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita in Madhya Lila, in 19th chapter, text one actually starts off very beautifully, where it actually says uh, that how at the time of creation, Krishna empowered Brahma to do the task of creation. Similarly, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he came, he actually empowered who? Rupa Goswami. Okay. To actually fulfill the mission for him, which he descended. Right. So actually, when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there's this famous verse, Anarpita Charim Chirat, Karuna Avatiyena Kilo, Samayirpitam Unnato Jwala. Right? So when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is coming, he's actually giving us a very special rasa. Right? The highest love of Goloka Vrindavan is Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is distributing to the most insignificant jivas. Right? But how is he actually giving this love for everyone? He actually empowered Rupa Goswami. And that's why we are also known as what? Rupa Nugas. Right? Rupa Nugas. We are following in the footsteps of Rupa Goswami, who is empowered by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to actually spread this highest love of Goloka Vrinda. Right? So that verse is very beautiful. You can look it up later. Uh, CC Madhya 19.1. And it says, just like how Krishna empowered Brahma at the time of creation, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has empowered Rupa Goswami. And hence in our Mangalacharan prayers, why do we actually say, Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadam. He is the one who actually understood the heart, Mano Bhishtam of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He is actually empowered with that, uh, that special rasa that special taste, the love for Goloka Vrindavan. Right? And when we follow Rupa Goswami, then by the mercy of Rupa Goswami coming through our Parampara system, we can actually experience that Unnato Jala that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given us. Right? And how do we follow Rupa Goswami? Well, Rupa Goswami has given us the entire process. Now, what the Srila Prabhupada has established, you know, you know Mangla Arti, our chanting, our reading Bhagavatam, our associating with devotees, it's all on the basis of Rupa Goswami's principles in Bhakti Rasamrita, Sinu, Updesha Amrita, etc. Okay, so, so uh, that's just a point about how when the Lord comes, he actually empowers his associate. And then when the Lord finishes his mission, then he says, okay, now the purpose is fulfilled. Then he actually takes away. So similarly with Arjun, because now the purpose was over, the mission is over. So now he actually withdraw that amazing power that Arjun had that astonished even the demigods. In that section, anyway, I'm going a little bit on this because this point principle of empowerment is so wonderful, uh, particularly in that chapter to describe that even today, like Prabhupada actually in that purpose in that chapter, he makes the point that no one can preach the glories of the holy name. No one can preach the holy name. No one can preach Krishna consciousness unless he is empowered by the Lord. So even today, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is empowering jivas to actually spread Krishna consciousness. And in that, uh, in one of the purpose, Prabhupada makes the point that how 
what is our qualification to be empowered by Lord Chaitanya? Because we need that empowerment. Otherwise, how can we do anything to please Srila Prabhupada to further this ISKCON movement? We need that empowerment. Krishna Shakti Bina Tar Nahi Pravartan. Without that empowerment, we cannot do that. How can we be empowered by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? The answer Prabhupada gave is we have to be always eager to serve. Prabhupada. When we have that always eagerness to serve, how can I serve my Guru Maharaj? How can I serve Prabhupada? And that is, that is our constant meditation. Then Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu empowers us. And with that empowerment, we can actually serve the mission of our Guru and Shri Prabhupada. Okay? Okay. So let's uh, go further. <clears throat> Okay, so, um, and then Prabhupada also makes a point that no one should be puffed up with any power that they have. Because why? Krishna is empowering us and at any moment Krishna can take away that power. So if you consider Arjun's case, right, he was so powerful, such a powerful warrior, right? And Mahabharata, we read about the glories of Arjun's power, right? how in that uh, war of Virat, he single-handedly Defeated the entire Kuru, uh, Kuru army. That is the power of Arjuna. Right? So that entire power, right? in a moment it was taken away. And hence Prabhupada makes a point that we should never be puffed up with the power. Because Krishna can at any moment take away our power. Our power of what? Even our power of talking, our, talk, our power of hearing, our power of seeing. Anything can be taken away at any moment by Krishna. Hence, how much grateful we should be to Lord Shri Krishna for anything that we have. Because Krishna has given us, we always offer our gratitude to Krishna. And knowing any, any time that, oh Krishna, if you want to take it away, it is yours. You have given it to me. It's just, you know, you're just uh, giving it to me for some time. But now you take it away, you take it away. But our mood is, we are always grateful. And because Krishna has given us, we always use that in Krishna's service. The mood of gratitude and the whatever we have been given, we always use that in Krishna. Oh, so, text number six. This is okay, this uh, point about empowerment and how Arjun is saying that, yes, I, was, I had all that power that astonished all the demigods. And then we'll read further that how he was actually able to please Lord Shiva. He was able to defeat Indra and all the other demigods, right? And all that power is given. Text number six. So who's next? <clears throat> Maybe someone can, Radha Radhika, if uh, people are not reading, you can just point out. Hare Krishna. Um, yeah. Text six. I have just lost him whose separation for a moment would render all the universes unfavorable and void, like bodies without life. Hmm. A very nice example is given like bodies without life. Right? I have just lost him whose separation. Shana Vyogena, right? Shana in a moment. What Vyogena means separation. Right? So uh, separation for a moment would render all universes. And the word is very nice. A priya darshana. Right? So priya means dear. A priya means not. Uh, which is something which is uh, unfavorable and void, right? Like bodies without life. So when Krishna has departed, this entire universe right, has almost become void, just like the body without life. So and because the body has life, we are doing so many things. But as soon as the soul leaves the body, you know, like Prabhupada makes a point that after some time, even the relatives don't want to be close to the body. It's a dead body. So just like that. So Krishna basically is pointing out, Arjun is pointing out that Krishna is basically the life of this universe. And when Krishna has left, the entire universe is void, null, and dead. Right? So Prabhupada in the purport, he says in the first sentence of the purport, factually for a living being, there is no one dearer than Krishna. <laughs> so beautiful, Prabhupada starts out. Like, because this verse is saying, that Arjun is saying, that without Krishna, it's all void. So Prabhupada starts off, actually, our real love, there's no one dearer to us than Krishna. And how can we understand this? 
you know, how can we understand? And Prabhupada explains very nicely. He says, we are all attached to the material body. But the material body has no, is nothing, is zero, is void without the spirit soul. So it is Atma. And that's why we all hold on to our life. Our instinct is something happens, we want to save ourselves, save our life. That means what? We are so attached to actually the Atma. Because the Atma leaves, and that's it, life is gone. Right? So we are so attached to the Atma. Right? So there's no one dearer to us than actually the Atma. But the Atma is actually there because of Paramatma. And the Paramatma is there because of Krishna. Like how Bhagavad Gita actually says that Brahman, Paramatma, they are all just the energies of Krishna. Krishna is Swayam Bhagavan. Vadanti Tat Tattva Vidas Tattvam Yad Gyanam Avir Brahmeti Paramatma. Bhagavan Iti Shabda. The ultimate understanding is Bhagavan. The Paramatma and Brahman are just expansions of Krishna. So, body, life. Life means spirit soul. Spirit soul means is dependent on Paramatma, right? And Paramatma comes from Krishna. So finally, if you go, no one dearer to us than Atma, but Atma is dependent on Paramatma. Then finally, Prabhupada brings step by step and finally says, actually, there is no being, no one dearer uh, to us than Lord Shri Krishna. <laughs> How Prabhupada is like so, you know, his, his love for Lord Shri Krishna is brought out so wonderfully in this purpose. So, um, yes, Prabhupada makes that point. Okay. And the other point here, you can say, the only reason that the Lord maintains any universe, I heard this uh, point from Madhavan and Prabhu, he explains that this, in this universe is actually working. Why? Why is the Lord even maintaining this universe? Because there are devotees on the planet. If the devotees are not there, then the Lord has nothing to do with this. Like, yes, he has care. He loves all living entities. No doubt that love is there. But the living entities are not concerned for him. Then the Lord is there. But because devotees are there on the planet, the Lord has so much love for the devotees that the planet is, uh, uh, it is not unfavorable and void. Because of the devotees, the Lord is actually maintaining the planet. The Lord is present through the uh, discussions of the devotees. Right. The Hari Katha of the devotees, the Lord is actually present in this evening. Okay, so text number seven. Our only, yeah, only by his merciful strength was I able to vanquish all the lusty princes assembled at the places of King Drupad for the selection of the bridegroom. With my bow and arrow, I could pierce the fish target and thereby gain the hand of Draupadi. So repeatedly in these verses, like from 7 all the way to 17, 18, we will see that verse, that point that comes up, only by his merciful strength. Only by the mercy of Krishna. right? And that is how a devotee actually uh, you know, lives. He says like everything that's happening is only by the mercy. And, you know, they can write that phrase only by the mercy. Everything that's happening in, in our life, only by the mercy of Krishna. You know, Arjun Kudav easily said, I am so powerful. I have my Gandiva. You know, I have I'm so powerful and then I, I could defeat Indra and all the demigods. I could even astonish Shiva. I am so no, but he said everything that has happened is only by this mercy of Krishna. Right? So here he's actually making the point that only by Krishna's mercy. When, and this is particularly talking of when he actually won the hand of Draupadi. So, see, in these verses, that is, yes, the entire story of Mahabharata is there. And one can go back and read the story. But our focus, what is our real focus in Bhagavatam? What is, okay, someone can unmute and say. Prayers. Prayers. And prayers. Okay, the prayers of the devotees to Krishna. Okay, what else are we looking for? Krishna's mercy. In everything. Okay, Krishna's mercy in everything. Okay. Krishna's dealings with his devotees and his devotees' love for Krishna. Ah, that rasa, the dealing between the devotees and Krishna and how Krishna treats all his devotees, that love between the devotee and Krishna. What is Bhagavatam? Rasam Palayam. Right? It is that rasa that we are looking for. 
So yes, one can go and read the Mahabharata story, but in the story, what we are looking for is how the devotee actually, you know, uh, took shelter of Krishna, how he had that exchange, and how Krishna protected the devotee in different. What was that exchange like? That is what is Ashram. That's what we are looking for. Right? So here he says, only by the merciful strength of uh, Krishna that he could pierce the target. Right? So Prabhupada talks about like how the, the, the fish that was hanging and there was a chakra and then he had to shoot the arrow through that wheel and it was on a reflection of water. You can see up, you have to see now. All those things, right? All those details Prabhupada talks about in the purport. So uh, one thing, when you read the Mahabharata story, uh, you know, we we read that how different princes, they actually came and many of them could not even lift that a bow, you know, because Drupad had a particular bow kept that he, the princess had to lift and then use that to shoot the arrow. Right? So many princes came, they couldn't even lift the bow. Those who lifted the bow, they could not string the bow. Like, so you have the bow and then there is string. And if you have seen like in Mahabharata, they show that they take the string and then string the bow. And because the bow is so huge and heavy, just to string it is actually requires a lot of effort. Right? And then many people, many of these princes, so some of them could not even pick the bow. Some of them picked the bow. And then they could not even string it. So why are stringing it? Because the bow like reflects, they were thrown back at the described in Mahabharata. So so many feet away. Because the bow, they tried to string it, but they were unable to string it. Right? And uh, so only selected few could actually even string the bow. Right? So when, what was Arjun's attitude? When he actually came, Mahabharata describes that before even lifting the bow, he actually prayed to Lord Krishna. He prayed to Krishna who was actually present in that assembly. And he prayed to Krishna, he took his permission. And, he prayed. and um, so that is one exchange that we see. And it is actually by Krishna's mercy that Arjun could um, you know, pierce the eye of that fish. And then also we see that later on, after Arjun had won Draupadi, then how all the kings were like, oh, we are insulted. You know, how could Draupad allow a Brahmana to shoot the arrow? This is not fair. And then they started, they had a fight. Actually, Karna picked up his arrows and Karna and Arjun described, had a very intense fight right there. And then Bhima also was there. And there was a fight. Uh, Bhima also had a fight with other warriors. And then finally, it came to the point that all the kings in the assembly said, well, first they should say who they are. Without saying who they are, we are fighting. Once they say who they are, once we know their identity, we all will fight them. So all the kings in the assembly, then they decided, oh, we will fight them. But then Krishna actually intervened. And Krishna said, oh, no, no, what is done is all fine. It is all righteously done. You know? So Krishna intervened and through his you know, magical word, he appeased everyone. And then everyone said, okay, it is fine. They have won. So we see how Krishna... Throughout the episode, it's actually Krishna who is actually making everything happen in such a wonderful way. Right? Okay, let's go further. Next number eight. Because he was near me, it was possible for me to conquer with great dexterity the powerful king of heaven, Indradev, along with his demigod associates, and thus enable the fire god to devastate the Kandava forest. And only by his grace was the demon named Maya saved from the blazing Kandava forest. And thus we could build our assembly house of wonderful architectural workmanship where all the princes assembled during the performance of Rajasur Yagya and paid you tribute. Mm. So, uh, just give me one more thing. So, so uh, did you discuss the story of Kandava? I think everyone knows the story of the Kandava forest. Yes, no. Yes, I see people nodding. Yes or no? Yeah, okay. So yes. You, okay. Okay, so you know the story of Kandava Forest. So, uh, <clears throat> so, so again, let's see the rasa here, how Krishna actually played the role here. So, um, so how Indra actually, he was protecting the Takshaka, right? Yeah, Takshaka in the Kandava Forest. So Indra, whenever Agni Dev, Agni Dev wanted to eat the Kandava forest. Why? Because he had indigestion. Because of why? Too much ghee. 
<laughs> so there was a sacrifice, there was too much ghee offered and then uh, Agni Dev was, that's why he was facing indigestion. And then Brahma said, well, you eat this Kandava forest because it's uh, many herbs. And then by that, you will actually uh, recover. But, but the problem was Indra's friend Takshaka was in the forest. So uh, when our kind of, uh, Agni Dev tried to eat that forest, and Indra showered rain and then he was unable. So he came to Krishna Arjun and he said, you help me, you know, you, uh, you know, uh, eat this kind of forest. And then, um, so uh, when he took shelter of Arjun and Krishna, Arjun assured him, yes, I will protect you. And that's the time when Arjun gets his Gandiva and also his chariot. And so Agni Dev actually gives him his Gandiva bow and the chariot. Right? So Arjun takes over. Yes, you have taken shelter of me. I will protect you. And anyone who was actually coming out of the forest, right? Krishna was actually using his chakra to kill them or Arjun was shooting arrows and killing anyone who's coming out of the forest because he wanted everyone in the forest to be devastated. Right? And also it's described that uh, how uh, Indra saw that, oh, there was so much fire and then like he showered rain and then there was a fight between Arjun and Indra, but Arjun was able to defeat Indra. He was able to defeat Indra. And now he's saying, Krishna, this is only because of you. Now, this part of the next part of the verse says about that Maya Dhanava, who is actually an Asura. And when he worked, he was in the forest, and when he came out of the forest, our Krishna threw his Sudarshan chakra to kill Maya Dhanava. Right? But Maya Dhanava, he came and took shelter of Arjun. He came and took shelter of Arjun. And Arjun actually said, yes, I will protect you. Because you have taken shelter of me, anyone who takes shelter of Kshatriya, that Kshatriya means to protect, the Kshatriya says, yes, I will protect you. So we see that Krishna was going to kill Maya Dhanava, but Arjun actually is the one who gave protection to uh, Maya Dhanava. But here you see how Arjun is saying, it is only by his grace that Maya Dhanava was saved. You see the point? It is Arjun who actually saved. Krishna was going to kill him, but Arjun is saying, only by Krishna's mercy, I actually, Maya Dhanava was saved, right? And this is the mood of a Vaishnava, that even though it was he who actually protected Maya Dhanava, it was actually, he's saying, Krishna, it is you, everything is you, right? It's all by your mercy. So that point is very nice. Okay, and then, uh, and then, oh yeah, another wonderful interaction here. Again, this shows the, you know, mood of Vaishnava, that, uh, after Maya Dana was protected, then he came to Arjun and he told Arjun, Arjun, you have protected me. Please uh, say how I can serve you. And Arjun, what does he say? No, no, I just did my duty. I cannot take any service. I cannot take anything in exchange for what I have done for you. But Maya Dana was again coming to Arjun and say, Arjun, please uh, give me, tell me some way I can serve you. But Arjun said no. But it was Krishna who said, okay, I will actually engage you in the service of the devotee. So these two points, Prabhupada actually elaborates in the purport. And uh, he says very nicely in this purport, uh, text number eight, right? No, I think it was number nine. <clears throat> right. So Prabhupada says, devotees are therefore more merciful than the Lord and in devotional service, the mercy of a devotee is more valuable than the mercy of the Lord. This is the essence. This is what we are looking for, right? So devotees are more merciful than the Lord. Like how in the Bhagavad Gita, in text uh, chapter 3, text uh, 29 in the purport, where Krishna is actually making the point that how he does not interfere with the free will of the conditioned soul. Like Krishna does not interfere. Okay, you want to stay away? Okay, you do your own nonsense. So Krishna does not do it. But then Prabhupada says, but the devotees of the Lord are more merciful and hence they go door to door and knock on the door and say, Jeev Jago, why are you sleeping? Take this book, Bhagavad Gita. Whatever, the books on yoga and meditation, just take it. This is going to transform you. And Prabhupada says, this shows how a devotee is more merciful than the Lord. And also the point is, a conditioned jiva, you know, with all our sins, we cannot approach the Lord. What is our qualification? We are sinful, we are contaminated with lust, anger, greed. But we can approach who? The devotee. We cannot directly approach the Lord. We are not qualified. 
but we can't take shelter because the devotees are so merciful. So even though we are contaminated, we have all these anartha, we can fall at the feet of a Vaishnava and say, please help me. Please, I have come and taken shelter. And hence the mercy of a devotee is actually more valuable than the mercy of the Lord. Okay, such a beautiful point. Okay, and towards the end of the purpose, the last one line says the process is that by the grace of the devotee, sorry, uh, person, by the grace of the devotee, the mercy of the Lord is obtained, right? So by the grace of the devotee, so the devotee, because they are so kind, by their mercy, we get mercy of Krishna, right? And how does Krishna's mercy come to us? If you're not reading the sentence, please give it a thought. How do we get Krishna's mercy? Through his devotees. Okay, but how do we know that Krishna's mercy is coming upon us? When the devotees are because we have found a devotee. What is that? Because we have found, we have discovered, we have okay. been in contact. Okay, so okay, so we have found a devotee. By the mercy of the devotee, we have got the mercy of Krishna. But how does Krishna's mercy come upon our life? We have good association. Okay, that's getting close. So in this sentence, Prabhupada says. The mercy of the Lord comes in the way that He actually gives us service. Chance to serve. Service of Vaishnavas, service of the devotees of the Lord is a gift. Is the mercy of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Such a wonderful point. So the last sentence, Prabhupada says, and by the mercy of the Lord, a chance to serve the Lord's devotees of them. Mm -hmm. So when, how do we know we have the mercy of the Lord? If we get a chance to serve Vaishnavas, that is actually a sign that Krishna's mercy is upon us. And how is this related to the story? The same point, that point I said, that Maya Danava wanted to serve Arjun, but Arjun said, no, no, I have just done my duty. But then he approached Krishna and Krishna said, okay, you build this assembly for me. So it was Krishna who engaged Maya Dhanava in the service of this own devotee. And similarly, it is Krishna's mercy that he engages in the service of Christ. Okay, very, very wonderful point. Okay, text number nine. Sarva Vitru. Your respectable younger brother who possesses the strength of 10,000 elephants killed by his grace, Jarasandha, whose feet were worshipped by many kings. These kings had been brought for sacrifice in Jarasandha's Mahabhairava Yagna, but they were thus released later. They paid tribute to your majesty. It is only by Krishna's mercy that Bhima could defeat Jarasandha. Right? So, in a storyline, I won't go, but basically, Krishna was in assembly and then he got the message from all these kings who were captured, 20,000 kings who were captured by Jarasandha, saying that, oh, Krishna, please protect us. Just a side note, we were actually in, uh, just last week in Govardhan, and uh, in Govardhan, uh, His Grace Bhurijan Prabhu did an entire, uh, you know, six sessions, two hours each, on this pastime of the king's prayers to Krishna. And it is you know, the recording, I can send you the link, but if you hear the recording, how, and this is, I was, you know, appreciating that how Vaishnava, like Bhujan Prabhu, like he's such an advanced Vaishnava, how he can bring out the rust of Sriman Bhagavatam in any pastime of the Sriman And when he actually explained that pastime, towards the end, we were all like just amazed, you know, Amazed at how he's actually brought up this story. And so practical, you know, so wonderful instructions for us. So, and yes, yeah, so the kings actually they send a messenger to Krishna that, oh, Krishna, we have been captured by Jarasan, please save us. And then Krishna, and at the same time, Narad Muni actually comes and says, oh, Maharaj, you just did in Rajasuya Yagya. And then Krishna says, okay, should I do this? Should I do this? Which one should I do? And then he asks uh, Uddhav, he says, Uddhav, you, you know, give us advice. Should I go to free these kings? Or should I go to the Rajasuya Yagya? And then Uddhava actually says, actually you go to Rajasuya Yagya. And then because a part of Rajasuya Yagya would actually include killing Jarasan, then you actually, you know, and he tells the whole plan. 
you go there, you take Bhima, you take Arjuna, and then you go in the disguise of Brahmanas, and then you actually ask uh, Jarasan for charity, and then he'll give charity, and then in that charity, you ask for uh, just individual fight, not the whole army, just one to one fight, and then that Bhima fight. And in that also, in that past time, is described. How did Bhima kill Jarasandha? It is said Krishna empowered Bhima with two things. One with the strength and second with the intelligence. Intelligence in the sense that both were fighting, but still there was a particular way in which Jarasan could be killed, right? And what is that? Krishna actually takes a stick, breaks it into two and throws it, right? And that way he actually empowered Bhima to actually kill Jarasandha. So it is only by the mercy of Krishna that how the entire plan, how Uddhav told Krishna, this is how you do it. And then how Krishna went and he executed the whole plan. You see, Krishna's hand is there in every situation. And this shows how Krishna loves his devotee. This shows Krishna's love for his devotee. So that is uh, text 9, text 10. It was he only who loosened the hair of all the wives of the miscreants who dared open the cluster of your queen's hair, which had been nicely dressed and sanctified for the great Rajasuya sacrificial ceremony. At that time, she fell down at the feet of Lord Krishna with tears in her eyes. So, uh, so this is talking of the time when you know, Draupadi that was this rope. So it is said that as soon as Draupadi, that entire episode happened, where right? Dushasan and all the Kauravas and Karna, they actually were a part of this entire thing of disrobing Draupadi, right? It is Krishna who loosened the hair of all the wives of the miscreants, basically saying that he actually at that time decided that all these people are going to be killed. Why? Because they have insulted my devotee. Right? And Prabhupada focuses on this point in the purport. He says in the purport that Krishna, uh, this is the end of the purport, the last two lines, the Lord can tolerate insults upon himself by any miscreant because the father tolerates even insults from his son. So if in case someone is insulting Krishna, Krishna is very tolerant. Oh, it's okay. right? But he, he never tolerates insults upon his devotee. By insulting a great soul, one has to forego all the results of pious acts and benedictions also. So what do you see from this? If someone insults Krishna, Krishna is saying, oh, it's okay. But if someone insults a devotee of Krishna, Krishna says, that's it. You insulted my devotee, everything over. Your pious acts, your benedictions, you're going to be killed. Right? So they insulted Draupadi at that time. Okay, it was Krishna who said, all these people are going to be killed. All their wives are going to become widows. Krishna has decided it's going to happen. And this shows how Krishna, like if we are under the shelter of Krishna, we are always protected. So in that episode, so one point is we see how Krishna has actually already killed all those people who have insulted his own pure devotee, Draupadi. In the other part, right, uh, from Draupadi's point of view, okay, let me uh, take a quick uh, question here. So, why did uh, Pandavas go all, through all the sufferings? What was uh, Bhishma Dev's final conclusion? In chapter 9 of the Bhagavatam, we discuss that Bhishma Dev says, like, oh, how is it possible you Pandavas went through so much suffering? Time is the first factor. Okay, time. Okay. And then he says, their own karma. Okay, their own karma. Then, okay, then he rejects that. He says, like, rejects oh, that. Now, because only Krishna wanted all this, you know, for the rasa, he, he, he had to go through. Finally, he comes to the point and he says that why all this happened? Just to exchange the rasa between Krishna and his devotee. Very nice story. So that was the whole sequence. You know? so, very nice sequence. so last he actually comes to the point that it is only that rasa to experience that deep, intense love between Krishna and his devotees, that all these episodes actually took place. So in Draupadi's case, when she was being disrobed in that assembly, right, that most humiliating scene, right, and then she actually took shelter of her husbands, and there was 
no hope on the side to Chaldaro Bhishma, Drona, no hope, Dhritarashtra, no hope. And finally, she raised both her hands and called out, right? Hey, Krishna, hey, Govinda, hey, Madhava, right? And then it is described that Krishna, who was seated in Dwarka, he heard Draupadi's prayers, right? And it said, like, initially Draupadi was holding on to Sari with one hand, and then she was calling Krishna. And Krishna said, okay, let her, you know, really take shelter of me, right? And then when she gave up both her hands and called out to Krishna, then Krishna is described, he heard Draupadi's cries, and he expanded himself by his inconceivable power, and one of his expansions went swiftly to Hastinapur, right? And by his mystic power, he entered into the assembly hall. No one saw him, and no one was able to see him. And then he provided Draupadi unlimited supply of God. And the discussion pulled and pulled, and then uh, he could not destroy that. Right? So, uh, so the point here is Krishna never tolerates any insults to his devotees, and that shows Krishna's love for his devotees. And uh, Draupadi's episode has so much to love about the point of a complete surrender to Krishna right? and, uh, and how Krishna responds. So it says here that she fell down at the feet of Lord Krishna with tears in her eyes. So one may say Krishna was not there. Right? How did she fall at the feet of Krishna? So two explanations is one, what I just said, that Krishna uh, expanded and one of the forms of Krishna entered the assembly and no one could see except Draupadi. So she fell at the feet. The second Vishnu Chakravit Thakur says she actually saw Krishna by remembrance in her mind, and in that she actually fell at the feet of Krishna. Okay, okay, but all this, you know, as soon as uh, Draupadi was actually destroyed, then it was Krishna who actually said, okay, all the other, all these people are going to be killed, and all their wives are going to be widowed. It's all Krishna's. Okay, text number one. During our exile, Durvasa Muni, who eats with his 10,000 disciples, intrigued with our enemies to put us in dangerous trouble. At that time, he, Lord Krishna, simply by accepting the remnants of food, saved us. By his accepting food thus, the assembly of Munis, while bathing in the river, felt sumptuously fed and all the three worlds were also satisfied. Mm -hmm. So we know the story, eh? very famous story. So the Sanskrit word that's uh, really nice to note is three lokim triptam. When Krishna is satisfied, then the three lokas are satisfied. Three triptam, right? Three lokas are satisfied. So that's a nice point to note. And uh, in the purport, Prabhupada actually talks about, <clears throat> he gives a, uh, you know, talks the story of Dura Samuni. So you have read all this. Um, in the purple, Prabhupada talks about that how when uh, Draupadi had eaten, you know, already eaten and the Rasamuni had come, and then the Pandavas were actually thinking, okay, how would we feed the Rasamuni? He gets angry so easily, right? And then Prabhupada says, when devotees are in difficulty, then what happens? They get an opportunity to think about Krishna with rapt attention. Such a beautiful point. So when devotees are in difficulty, it is an opportunity for us to actually really take shelter of Krishna, really chant Krishna's holy name with great attention, with great you know, calling out for Krishna. So Prabhupada makes that point. So Pandavas, when I mean, they were in that situation, that Draupadi had eaten and all this, you know, how many thousand of disciples of, uh, 10,000 disciples of Durasa was there, then they actually thought of Krishna with rapt attention. And what did Krishna do? Immediately he came there. He just had that uh, spinach and one rice that was attached to the pot. And just by eating that, the whole world, three, uh, three locum triptum, the whole world is satisfied. And that's a practical point for us. When we satisfy Krishna, everyone is satisfied. Right? Just like, what are the two Bhagavatam examples? Eating the, the stomach and watering the roots of the tree. Yeah. So we feed, uh, eat, and then when food goes to our stomach, then the entire body is energized. You water the root, the entire tree is. So similarly, we satisfy Krishna, and then the, all the three worlds are satisfied. Now, Prabhupada, in the last sentence of the purple, right? I'm going to read that. 
Another instruction is that every householder must offer food to the Lord. And the result will, will be that everyone, even a company of guests numbering 10,000 will be satisfied because of Lord's being satisfied. That is the way of devotion. So consider that uh, by chance there is a situation that there is a big yatra, you know, 3,000 people or okay, 500, why 3,000, coming to your house and they ring the bell and they say, oh, we are here, the yatra, this was a stop here. And the entire Ratyatar position has come and 300 devotees are right at your door for prasadam. Then what do you do? You know, please Krishna, by Krishna's mystic, like Prabhupada makes the point. Lord is the greatest mystic. He is Yogeshwara. By his mystic potency, everyone will be satisfied. Right? You satisfy Krishna, everyone will be satisfied. Right? So Prabhupada says, every householder must offer to the Lord. And when the Lord is satisfied with eating, Everyone will be satisfied. Even if you get 10,000 visitors to your house, they all will be satisfied. <laughs> Definitely. Prabhuji, here I have a question. Here it says it is Duryodhana's plan, but Durvasmuni, he is a sage, and how he agreed to do that. Like he, Duryodhana wanted Durvasmuni go after Draupadi has taken his taken her food. Why he agreed to do that? Why? Because, uh, you know, see, like Duryodhan, he had this whole, whole plan that he knew that Durasa gets uh, angry in a moment, right? So he, because he had this, always he was envious of Pandava, he was just thinking that how can he actually create more havoc to the Pandava? And he was saying, oh, Durasa Muni, please, you know, you, we are getting an opportunity to serve you. But we want our elder brothers also to get an opportunity to serve you. You're so wonderful. You're so great. So he did not, you know, he presented in such a way saying that, oh, you're giving us opportunity to serve. But why are you leaving my brother an opportunity to serve? Please go to him. You know, and the best time to go is at so-and-so time. Then they can serve you nicely. That way even they will be blessed by you. You know, and that is the mood. And the sage was thinking, yes, yes, very nice. You know, I'm blessing now Duryodhana. I will also bless you, still, you know, it is very nice. He's so concerned about his elder brother. So in that way, there was somebody went there. You know? And all these pastimes we see, you know, Krishna is finally the behind everything. So at times, even these sages, they may remember and sages, they forget. You know? So that at the time, Durasamuni didn't know that, oh, Duryodhan is being tricky and by his mystic power, he wants this. At the time, he was just thinking, so nice, younger brother, you know, he wants his elder brother to get a chance to get the blessings. I will go and give him a chance. You know, nothing. So actually, Lord Krishna, like uh, Lord Krishna's plan, and he he wants actually uh, to give like more blessings from the Durvasa Muni, right? Lord Krishna's plan is only one. He wants to intensify his rasa with his devotees. Okay. No, like why exchange. Would why would pure devotees care about blessings of the Rasa? He just wants to intensify that, okay, now the devotees are in a difficult situation. They will remember me and then I can go and then I can have that spinach and the rice, that small thing that my devotees have eaten. I will actually one way get, you know, something that they have already eaten. First we offer to Krishna, but now he's going to get something that devotees have already eaten and Krishna wants to taste that Rasa there, you know. And then he actually, uh, that remembrance and that exchange, that is what Krishna is actually looking for. Very nice point, Prabhu. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank, Thank you, Prabhu. So let's proceed. Next number 12. Hare Krishna. It was by his uh, influence only that in a fight, I was able to astonish the personality of God. Uh, Lord Shiva and his wife, the daughter of Mount Himalaya. Thus, he, Lord Shiva, became pleased with me and awarded me his own weapon. Other demigods also delivered their respective weapons to me. And uh, in addition, I was able to reach the heavenly planets in his uh, uh, heavenly planets in this present body and was allowed a off elevated seat. Hare Krishna. So again, you see again and again in this verse, Arjuna is thinking about Krishna and saying all this that happened only by Krishna's mercy. So in this verse it says, only by Krishna's influence, right? I could astonish Lord Shiva. 
So in the, the Mahabharata stories that you know, we're going to Guru details, but he was able to astonish Lord Shiva. The boar came and then like Arjun shot an arrow and then Lord Shiva shot an arrow. Both came at the same time and then there was this fight between and Arjun was able to astonish Lord Shiva. Yeah? And then finally, actually Arjun was getting defeated and then he was to a point where he almost like fell back and he was thinking like, who is this personality? Who is this person who is so strong? And described that Arjun was shooting thousands of arrows at Lord Shiva. And he wasn't in disguise, right? So he didn't know he was Lord Shiva. But he was shooting thousands of arrows. And for Lord Shiva, nothing was happening. And Arjun was saying, who is this personality? That even my thousands of arrows is not affecting him. And then finally, when Arjun was getting weaker, then he actually uh, said that he created like kind of a, a figure of Lord Shiva. And then he offered the flower to Lord Shiva. And immediately that flower fell to the hunter who was in this guy. And he said, yes, this is Lord Shiva. Yeah. But all his power to astonish Lord Shiva. And then Lord Shiva was pleased that, oh, Arjun is so powerful. Yeah. He was pleased with his fighting skills. He said that is all because of Krishna. Right? And, uh, and also other demigods, they offered them, them, uh, them his weapons. And then he was actually going, able to reach the planet, uh, the heavenly planets, and he got a seat with Indra Dev. So that's how it is. I think all this is Krishna. Was For in the purple, Prabhupada compares devotees of Krishna versus devotees of demigods. Right? He says, devotees of Krishna, they are favored by all the demigods. But devotees of demigods may not necessarily be uh, favored by Krishna. And he gives the example of Ravana. He pleased Lord Shiva. But he was you know, killed by Krishna, Lord Ramchand, right? So Prabhupada says, so devotees of Krishna, they are favored. If you please Krishna, all the demigods are pleased with us. Right? And then if you please uh, demigods, then it is only the favor of that particular demigod, and that's also temporary. Right? Okay. And, uh, and also Prabhupada says, how devotees of Krishna, they know that all these demigods are empower representatives of Krishna and they know how to respect all the demigods. So Prabhupada says, like, we respect even an ant. What to talk of these demigods who are empowered by Krishna. Okay. And then Prabhupada also in the purport talks about, like, Arjun, how Arjun could actually enter the heavenly planet. And Prabhupada says, it's not like some mechanical way you can actually enter the heavenly planet. How can you enter the heavenly planets? What are the qualifications? Pious activities. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that hard uh, sacrifice for Okay, pious activities. This is uh, specific. But piety, right? Piety is amazing. So Prabhupada talks about three things. Sacrifice, austerity, and charity. He says these three. Only by accumulating, sacri doing sacrifices, doing charity, performing austerity, we get the pious presence by which we are actually be qualified to actually enter the heavenly. But here, for Arjun, it was only because of Krishna's mercy that he can actually go to the empty planet. Okay, okay text 13. <clears throat> when I stayed for some days as a guest in the heavenly planets, all the heavenly demigods, including King Indradev, took shelter of my arms, which were marked with the Gandiva bow, to kill the demon named Niva Kavacha. O king, dependent, descendant of Ajamida, at the present moment I am bereft of the supreme personality of God by whose influence I was so powerful. Yes. Yeah, so here he's saying that when he was in the heavenly planets, even the demigods, they actually took shelter of Arjun. Normally the demigods are much, much more powerful than uh, you know, entities on this planet. Demigods are super powerful. They have all the celestial weapons. But even they actually asked Arjun to help them in this fight against Nimata Kavacha. Nimata Kavacha, right? So that actually, and Arjun is saying all this is because Krishna actually empowered me. Right? But at the present moment, you know, Krishna has left, right? So I am Mushitaha, I am bereft of that Purushena, that personality of God. Eh? By only by his influence, I was actually so powerful. Okay, text 14. Let's keep going. Hare Krishna. 
the military strength of the Kauravas was like an ocean in which they dwelt. There dwelt many invincible existences, and thus it was insurmountable. But because of his friendship, I, seated on the chariot, was able to cross over it. And only by his grace was I able to regain the cows and also collect by force many helmets of the kings, which were bedecked with jewels that were sources of all brilliance. Hare Krishna. Mm. So in this verse and in the next, he actually talks about like how they were actually able to defeat the Kaurava army, right? such a powerful army. And Arjun says it is only due to Krishna. And this is true, right? Throughout Mahabharat, the war, we see again and again that it was only because of Krishna that Arjun and the Pandavas could defeat personalities like Bhishma Dev, personalities like Dronacharya, right? personalities like Karna, all these so powerful personalities, it was only because of Krishna's mercy that Arjun could defeat or the Pandavas could defeat Arjun. Right? And then uh, the other point is about that Virata, that uh, when the uh, Pandavas were in incognito, then actually it was Arjun alone who actually defeated the entire Kaurava enemy. And that also he says it is only because of Krishna. Now, interesting point here. When that Virat war was going on, was Krishna personally there? He was not personally there. Right? But still Arjun is saying, oh, it is only because of Krishna. So how we see that Arjun's mood is that Krishna, everything that's happened, whether Krishna was personally present or not, everything is only because of Krishna. Right? Okay. So a practical point here is uh, if Krishna is on our side, then even the most insurmountable can actually be conquered. Deviyesha gunamai mama mai duratya. Krishna himself is saying, this maya is duratya. It is insurmountable. How can we defeat maya? But if Krishna is on our side, then even the maya which is most difficult to conquer can actually be conquered. So, uh, so for us, our main thing is, can we have Krishna on our side? And how can we have Krishna on our side? One is our personal sadhana. When we are chanting the holy name, every mantra we are chanting, we are actually inviting Lord Sri Krishna. Krishna, please accept me on your side. Accept me as your eternal servant. Please accept me, please. Every mantra. We are actually calling Krishna and say, Krishna, please accept me on your side. Right? So we you want Krishna on our side, by that we can actually conquer anything. And the other thing is about, uh, so one is personal sadhana, and the second is about preaching. So how Prabhupada says, when we preach Krishna consciousness, it is a declaring war on Maya. How can we defeat Maya? But when we actually preach just for the pleasure of Srila Prabhupada, if we are going with that intention, then the Lord is actually on our side. Lord Chaitanya, Lord Nityananda are on our side and they are empowering us. Go, go preach. Right? Go. Become an instrument. Let's do it. And then when we actually go out and preach, we take like challenges, we take difficult situations and go out to spread Krishna consciousness, then we can personally perceive the presence, how the Lord is actually there in our life protecting us and using us as an instrument to spread Krishna consciousness all over the world. So through our personal sadhana and through preaching Krishna consciousness, we can experience, we can invite Krishna on our side and by that we can actually conquer the most inconquerable enemy. Okay, okay. next uh, text 15. Yes, it was he only who withdrew the duration of life from everyone and who in the battlefield withdrew the speculative power and strength of the enthusiasm from the great military phalanx made by the Kauravas, headed by Bhishma, Karna, Drona, Salya, etc. Their arrangement was expert and more than adequate, but he, Lord Sri Krishna, while going forward, did all this. Yes. So what did Krishna do when Krishna was sitting on the battle of uh, on the uh, chariot of Arjun, you know, as a chariot driver? 
So not only he was directing uh, Arjuna, the Pandavas, okay, do this, do this, you know, doing all the things, how to kill Bhishma, Drona, all those things Krishna was doing. But not only that, what else was he doing? Just by his glance, by Krishna glancing over the army, he was actually taking away their Ayu. Ayu means life, right? The, the word Ayu is used in Sanskrit. He was taking away their Ayu, he was taking away their power, right? Saha. He was taking away their power, their speculative power, and ojaha, their enthusiasm. So imagine, like, you know, you're going to fight with someone. And there is one person who's taking away their power, he's taking their enthusiasm, he's taking away their age, their lifespan, right? So who is actually doing the fighting? Who is actually really winning the war? Is it Krishna or is it the Pandava? It's Krishna. Krishna is taking away their life, their enthusiasm, fight, their power, everything. Just by his glance, Krishna is doing everything. Why? Just because of his love and his devotee. Right? So Arjun is recognizing that and saying, Krishna, this is only Krishna's because of his glance. He actually took away the power and hence they could defeat personality like Bhishma, Drona, Karna, and so on. Let's okay? yes, continue. 16. Uh, uh, 16. <coughs> great general. No, oh, no. Go ahead, Madhya, please. Okay. okay, great generals like Bhishma, Drona, Karna, Burishwara, Su Sharma, Shalya, Jayadrata, and Bahalika all directed their invincible weapons against me. But by his, Lord Krishna's grace, they could not even touch a hair on my head. Similarly, Prahlad Maharaj, the supreme devotee of Lord Nisimhadeva, was unaffected by the weapons that demons used against him. So anyway, I, I forgot some points from the previous verse. So I'll just go back to 15. <clears throat> so one thing is Prabhupada actually in the purple quotes uh, 1515 of Bhagavad Gita. Which is that verse? That Krishna actually gives us what? Matas, Mithir, Gyanam, Apohamansha. That he actually gives us remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. So if Krishna wants, he can take away all these things easily. And that's why by his glance, he took away all these things. Like the army, they forgot, right? He gave them remembrance. That they forget how to fight. They forget their enthusiasm, right? So Krishna did that, right? The last sentence of the purport of text 15 is because Arjun was lost affectionate devotee, the Lord did all this himself without personal anxiety by Arjuna. The Lord did all this without personal anxiety for Arjuna. That's how Krishna loves his devotees, that if we act as Nimitta Matra, Bhavya Sachin, we act as an instrument of Krishna, then Krishna takes away all our anxiety and says, you are an instrument. I will just use you as an instrument. Right? And that's it. Krishna does everything. And Prabhupada says, that is the way of the devotional service of the Lord. Chakravati Pan actually uh, elaborates and then he says that because Krishna is so beautiful when the other side army was looking at Krishna they forgot their mind you know how could they fight because their mind was stolen by Krishna's beauty and then he says uh, seeing Krishna's power they lost their enthusiasm seeing Krishna's glance they actually forgot how to take up weapons you know because Krishna's glance is so beautiful and you know, Chakravati Pad is such a Rasika Acharya that he's saying that Krishna is so beautiful. They looked at Krishna and they forgot, how should I take my bow? Is it this way or this way? They forgot how to take bows. Right? And then by his inconceivable influence, he took away their Prarabdha Karma, which is basically their lifespan. Okay. okay. So take 16, Matani, right? <clears throat> so in 16, again, he's talking about like Bhishma, Drona, Karna, all these personalities. Um, but again, the Lord Krishna's grace, like they could not even touch a hair on my head. And then he compared himself to Prahlad. He says, similarly, Prahlad Maharaj, like particularly Sanskrit said, Narhari Dasam. Who is Narhari Dasam? The servant of Narhari. Narsimhadev, Shri Prahlad Maharaj. He said, Narhari Dasam. Just like how Nars Narhari Dasam, Prahlad Maharaj, was protected by Lord Narsimhadev. Similarly, I was actually protected by Krishna. Like not even... Uh, they couldn't even touch a hair on my head. Rakhe Krishna Mareke, Mare Krishna, Rakhe Krishna. If Krishna wants to protect you, no one can even touch a hair on your head. Right? Now, if we compare uh, 
uh, Prahlad Maharaj and Arjun's situation. So Arjun was a powerful warrior with a Gandiva and like you know, immense strength and power. What was Prahlad Maharaj's position? He was just a small boy. So one side we have Arjun, super powerful. One side we have Prahlad, who is actually just a small boy. And Arjun had all the weapons, even celestial weapons. What did Prahlad have? Actually, he was just a small boy. But what is the so externally their situation? One can be said to be so powerful. One can be externally said to be a small boy. But the common factor was their unflinching faith in the shelter of the Lord. That is what is common. Right? Externally, situations may be different. And for each one of us, we are in different situations. But the common point is, do we have that unflinching faith in Krishna's protection? And if we have that faith, then Krishna will protect us. No doubt about that. The problem is we have doubts. Will Krishna really protect me? Is he listening to my prayers? You know, I am so rascal. Like, this Krishna really here? But Krishna is there. So we have to have that unflinching faith. So though externally, our situation is different, but the common point is that faith is Krishna's protection. Okay, next 17. It was by his mercy only that my enemies neglected to kill me when I descended from my chariot to get water for my thirsty horses. And it was due to my lack of esteem for my Lord that I dare engage him as my chariot driver. For he is worshipped and offered services by the best men to attain salvation. Mm. This is actually, now the mood of Arjun is slightly changing here. And he's actually saying that, uh, that you know, and Prabhupada explains in the purport that when there's a battlefield, like where do they get water from? You know, they don't have bislary to carry and keep on the chariot and say, oh, are we bislary funny? They don't have water like that. So where do they get water from, right? And he said, like, uh, Prabhupada explains that they used to use arrow and just pierce the earth and by which they used to get water. And Prabhupada explains that point in the purport. Uh, the Prophet says, now we have forgotten the signs of like you know, getting water directly from the uh, earth. Uh, but Prabh uh, Arjun here is actually making the point that he's saying that only when I actually, you know, when the houses were thirsty and they had to get water, it was only because of Krishna that they did not shoot arrows at me, right? Because if you see in the war of Mahabharata, as the war progressed, no one was following any rules anymore. All the rules of warfare were being broken. So when Arjun get, got off to give water to the horses, maybe someone could have shot, shot an arrow and killed. But why did they not? Because actually that is because of Krishna's protection. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So now, so that is one point. The second point in this, it, it was due to my lack of esteem, particularly the word that used is uh, kumatina. Kumatina means bad consciousness, Prabhupada says. Okay. Arjuna is saying it is only because of my bad consciousness, right? lack of esteem, that I dare to engage him as my own chariot driver. Because I did not know the glories of the Supreme Personality of God, Krishna, I engaged him as my uh, chariot driver. The chariot driver is such a menial position. But this personality is actually the personality who is worshipped and offered services by the best of men. Particularly the two words that are used is uh, he is worshipped by Bhavya, the intelligent class of men, and he is actually uh, the shelter or who is a Bhavaya who is actually seeking liberation. So though even the devotee class of men, they actually worship him. And those who are seeking liberation, they actually take shelter of Krishna. So that glorious personality, who the impersonalists and the devotees who actually turn towards that personality, I engaged him as my own char chariot driver. That was only because of my uh, kumatina, because of my bad consciousness. Right? So Arjun is lamenting in that way. But Prabhupada explains, actually, you know, that is actually their, you know, their intimate relationship that Arjun actually, uh, Krishna became Arjun's uh, chariot driver. It was a transcendental relationship. So, the, so there was no 
like bad consciousness or lack of self esteem on arjun's part you know arjun is just expressing that mood in that feeling of the proper clarifies that point now this is actually a nice point about a mood of prayer where we can say that krishna i am an offender you know because of my bad consciousness my lack of esteem i have not recognized you krishna but yet krishna you are so merciful like from arjun's point of view he saying yet krishna you are so merciful that when my horses were thirsty you actually protected me from that mm-hmm. so our mood of prayer can be in that way that krishna i am such an offender but yet you are so kind about me that actually one uh, भजन में भक्ति में था तो वेरी एक्चुअली सीन कृष्ण अपराधी यदि नाम श्रद्धा कोरी प्राण बोरी दाके ना राम कृष्ण हरि अपराध दूरे जाए आनंद सागरे भासे से अनासे रसेरा पाते इफ वन एज एन ओफेंडर टू लॉर्ड कृष्ण बट रिस्पेक्ट्स हिज होली नेम एंड कॉल्स आउट विद ऑल हिज हार्ट एंड सोल राम कृष्ण हरि देन ऑल हिज ऑफेंसेस डिपार्ट एंड दैट पर्सन स्विम्स without difficulty in the ocean of divine bliss and transcendent knowledge so if one is an offender to krishna so we can think as oh, i am offended to lord krishna so many lifetimes i have turned away from krishna you know i am such a rascal yet krishna is so kind to me that when i chant his holy name ram krishna hari all krishna in a moment forgets all those offenses that i have done to him and then i can actually swim in the ocean of transcendent bliss and the feeling of happiness it's a nice mood of approaching krishna i'm so sinful yet you are so nice okay okay so um okay let's just read two more verses next person can do 18 19 together and then we we'll take a break can someone read for me yes mati thank Next. you yeah i i can do hari krishna prabhu ji for king his jokings and frank talks were pleasing and beautifully decorated with smiles his addresses on to me as o son of pratha o friend o son of the kuru dynasty and all such heartiness are now remembered by me and thus i am overwhelmed text 19 generally both of us used to live together and sleep sit and loiter together and at the same time of advertising oneself for acts of chivalry sometimes if there were any irregularity i used to reproach him by saying my friend you are very thought very truthful even in those hours when his value was minimized he being the supreme soul used to tolerate all those utterings of mine excusing me exactly as a true friend excuses his true friend or a father excuses his son hari krishna yeah, so <clears throat> so in the uh, text 18 he's saying when he's uh, saying you this thing that his joking and frank talks were pleasing and beautifully decorated as well so you know now krishna is departed so naturally he's thinking about you know how krishna used to joke and he used to talk in such a pleasing way beautiful smile and he used to call me o oh, son of pritha o oh, friend o oh, son of kuru dynasty you know and uh, he's remembering all that and it's natural right i think uh, you know if we have someone dear whom we have lost then we think about oh he used to call me like this and he used to call me like that and he used to smile like that so arjun is remembering all that in text 19 he's saying he used to live together sleep together and then he sometimes uh, arjun used to use sarcastic words you know to krishna but even when i actually used to use sarcastic words minimize his value krishna was so kind that he tolerated all those dealings that i had with him just like a true friend excuse a true friend or a father excuses a son uh this is actually similar to uh, bhagavad gita chapter 11 there also uh, it's a similar mood where arjun actually after seeing krishna's universal form he actually says that you know i have called you he uses uh, what's that sakheti matva prasavam yad uktam he uh, he krishna he yadava he sakheti arjun says i called you hey krishna hey yadava hey sakheti not knowing your glory 
And then he actually makes the point in text 44, 11 chapter. He says, please forgive me. Just like a father forgives a son, a friend forgives a friend, or a husband forgives a wife. Similar, you tolerate what wrong has done to you. So similar mood is there. And Prabhupada in the purport actually says that yes, Arjuna is asking for forgiveness, but Krishna actually likes these chastisements, these words of reproachment more than all the Vedic hymns. And anyone can remember a previous section where we read the same point? There's a question also on this section. In the exam. Ladies on the rooftops. Yes. The oh. ladies of the rooftop of Hastinapur. There also the same point was made. That more than the Vedic hymns, Krishna was appreciating their prayers. right? Even though they were improperly composed. Because they were filled with so much love and devotion. Okay. okay so let's uh, stop here. Take a quick break. We'll uh, come back and we'll continue. Okay. So uh, before leaving, if you want to share uh, a point, or any questions, maybe you can have a quick sharing. Any point, just uh, quickly review and any point you like from the whole discussion. You can do a quick review. Proceed. We'll take a break. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, I like the point of you know following the Rupa uh, Rupa Goswami is always eager to serve. But, uh, that's the point I like. When we are e always eager to serve, we are empowered by the Lord. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Prabhuji, I like the process. Uh, by the grace of the devotees, the mercy of the Lord is obtained. And by the mercy of the Lord, a chance to serve the Lord's devotees is obtained. Mm -hmm. I really like the service. Yeah. Yeah. Prabhuji, when you get a chance, can you share the bhajan link you said? Bhakti, you know the talk. Thanks. Prabhuji, I really like the point that we should not be puffed up um, about anything. Everything can be taken away in a moment. Everything is because we have is because of Krishna's mercy only. And hence, we should use everything in Krishna's service. And service. Mm -hmm. Prabhuji, I really like the point that I really like the point that uh, personal sadhana to have Krishna on our side, mm -hmm. praying for him, improving our sadhana. Every mantra we chant is actually an opportunity to invite Krishna. Krishna, please come, be on my side. Please be seated in the core of my heart. Thank you, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Yes. The, the devotees of the Lord are more merciful than the Lord. Yes. We are so rascals, but the devotees of the Lord are so merciful that they somehow engage us. In Thank you. Hare Krishna, I like the same point, but I like the connection also that uh, Krishna, by Krishna's mercy, you get the association of devotee or serve devotee. And then again, the mercy of the devotee, you get the Krishna's mercy. Yes, so it's like a cycle, right? <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Hare Krishna, Prabhu, um, recently uh, in a class, uh, just, you know, when we were reading about how who can reach the heaven, sacrifice, charity, and penance, and austerity. So, uh, in this in the recently, what I heard is like we devotees, we all do this sacrifice, charity, penances, we have austerities, ekadashis. We all become really eligible to go to heaven. But if we do not develop Krishna's, you know, factor in all this charity, austerity, and sacrifice, we will max to max end up in heaven. You know, mm. so you know we need to devotees. We need to fix our consciousness while doing all these aspects. It's a very important you know, because right. heaven you go like you know one second is gone. Uh, Mahaprabhu is gone. Kali Yoga finished. So, so while we are doing all our activities of devotion you know, by mercy of Srila Prabhupada, everything is actually uh, you know everything we are doing is directly connected to Krishna. Chanting the holy name, reading the Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam. But if you are not conscious while we are doing that, everything is actually. We are calling for Krishna. We want to go back to Krishna. That consciousness, that Krishna consciousness is not there when we are doing our activities. Then, uh, then our progress is very slow. There is a risk of missing yeah. out. 
Hare Krishna Prabhuji, almost like same point, uh, like uh, devotees of demigod and the difference is the devotees of Krishna conscious. That is the more important. Yes, thank you. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, yes. um, uh, Krishna is on our side, even the most unsurmountable can be conquered. And how can we get Krishna on our side? It, by personal service and, and by preaching Krishna consciousness. Thank you. I like how the Bhagavatam terms the rasa between Krishna and his devotees and how um, like you could go by the storyline but you can also go by looking at how Krishna is behaving how the devotees are behaving and we can learn so much and we can get so much um, like attraction that I want to develop a relationship with Krishna like these devotees have mm -hmm. this is one point actually in that that Buridan Prabhu's classes is so wonderful that he was again and again through that story, this is a Jarasana story, he was actually bringing up that, oh, how Krishna is so wonderful, the way he acts. And then through that, he was saying, like, don't you want to develop relationship with that person? You know, like again and again, he was bringing that point and it's so wonderful that we read the interactions of Krishna throughout Sri Bhagavatam. And he said like, oh, so loving, such wonderful person. Don't you want to go back to him? You know, and that actually develops our eagerness. Wonderful. Okay, so let's take a quick break and uh, come back in five minutes. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much.
Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, everyone. Prabhuji, we, I have a question. That, like, uh, Takshaka, uh, who, say, who was saved by Arjuna in the Kandava forest, is the same Takshaka as the uh, Parikshit Maharaj who got killed? I don't think so. It's different. Like, okay. Takshaka actually, in general, refers to like a species. You know, it's like more oh, okay, okay, okay. And actually, in that forest, you know, like when Arjuna and Indra were having the fight, then at one particular point, actually, uh, there was this you know, sound that told, I think it was Brahma who told uh, Indra, that actually Takshaka is not even there in the forest. So he wasn't even there. And then hence Indra stopped fighting. But his wife was there, but he was not there in the forest. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, would you so, remember you the story that uh, Takshaka took the revenge uh, uh, by you know, uh, by um, killing Parikshit Maharaj, have you heard of it? Mm. I know later on when Takshaka actually he kills Parikshit and Parikshit's son, he takes revenge on the entire yeah. Takshaka yeah. species. So it may be a particular one of those, you know, the Takshaka species. Okay. Okay. And someone else was thinking? Prabhuji, when we were reading it, Mohan Prabhu had this question that what was the destination of Maya Devan, final destination? Not read anywhere like further. I'm not even read like where his story continues, you know. 
So, but you know, we can see that he has served a pure devotee like Arjun. So certainly that service is always going to give him a, a very glorious uh, destination because though he's an Asura, he renders service to a pure devotee. So I don't have a knowledge of like where the story continues or I hope uh, everyone has uh, uh, yeah. broken your fast. It is, uh, oh, I didn't. Yeah, it is up to 10 or 7. So. Yeah. Prabhuji, I have one more question while reading this. So we are Pandavas, they saw all these bad women and the Kali Yuga is coming. But when Dikshit Maharaj was ruling again, the good signs, like everybody's happy. And I'm like, it's contradicting both their Kali Yuga. Like, so no, like it's not contradicting in the sense that at the time you just saw even in previous chapter and even now we are going to come to a section where you just started seeing all those women but again when Parishad was actually uh, established as the emperor then again the symptoms subsided a little bit mm -hmm. you know because Kali symptoms they appear and then as soon as there is like a religious or a devotee in charge then they subside a little bit but they again come but the entire age is Kali so even Kali's influence, it goes up and down based on oh. But now since, like, you know, how Prabhupada says that we, we are not in the mood that, oh, it is Kali Yuga, anyway, anything, everything is horrible, so why to preach? <coughs> That's not our mood. Our mood is that, yes, it is Kali Yuga, but yet we have the weapon to defeat the influence of Kali. Mm -hmm. And what is that weapon? Harina. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Particularly Shriman Bhagavatam. Yeah. Yes. Holy name and yes, holy name is certainly no? holy name and Shriman Bhagavatam. We distribute the holy name, we distribute Shriman Bhagavatam, and that can actually reduce the influence of Kali Yuga. Mm -hmm. And we somehow we have, we at least know and we have the we can be instruments to actually reduce Kali's influence. Okay, so should we proceed? So we'll go a little bit faster. Uh, come to, let's see. Okay, so we read up to text 20, uh, 19. So let's go text 20. <clears throat> Hare Krishna. Oh Emperor, now I am separated from my friend and dear most well-wisher, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And therefore my heart appears to be void of everything. In his absence, I have been defeated by a number of uh, infidel cowherd men while I was guarding the bodies of all the wives of Krishna. So this, uh, this, uh, okay, so the first part is, okay, I'm separated from my friend, dear most well-wisher, right, he's using those words again and again, you see, he's using the word that bandhu, and then how they have that intimate connection. So he's particularly remembering that intimate connection, it says, uh, Sakyam, Priyena, Surida, so all these very intimate, Ridaya, Sunya, and then because he is now departed, then what happened? My Ridaya became Sunya. Sunya means void. The Ridaya will become void. And then the next part of this verse is, in his absence, I have been defeated by a number of infidel covered men while I was guarding the bodies of the wives of Krishna. Yeah. So, um, in previously, in the previous chapter, Yudhishthir actually asked Arjuna, you know, are you actually distressed because you could not protect you know, uh, someone who needed protection? So here uh, uh, Krishna Arjuna is actually saying, yes, actually I could not protect. And who? Krishna's wives. You know? And uh, so this story, did you discuss? Like how, how, how come like Krishna's wives were actually you know, defeated by so there is one storyline about the uh, uh, Ashta, Ashta Vakra Muni, right? right? So he actually was pleased with them. And then because they laughed at how his body was, then he cursed them that you'll actually be robbed. And then, and then after, then he actually said, okay, you know, but uh, uh, what was the third part of it? He got pleased with them again. And then he said, uh, uh, later on, again, satisfied the Muni by prayers, and the Muni blessed them that they would regain their husband even after being robbed. Mm -hmm. So that is one Ashtavakra Muni. Now, the other story 
which is actually important is uh, these queens, right? So, um, let's see, should I come to that now or maybe I'll come to that later? Let me see. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll tell it right now. So, it is said that how Rukmini and those, uh, there were eight principal queens, right? So, the eight principal queens were there. Um, so, they, um, Okay, so actually Jaman Chakrabarti Pad actually explains this point. So maybe I'll say. So in uh, 10 Canto, in chapter 83, there is this conversation where how all these queens they actually mean Draupadi. Mm -hmm. And there's a conversation between the queens of Krishna and Draupadi, chapter 83. Right? And in that, uh, actually these queens they express their mood where they actually say that, you know, we know that Krishna, even when he was in Dwarka, He's actually calling out the names of the gopis in Vrindavan. So the eight principal gopi, uh, queens of uh, Rukmini, Satyabhama, all those eight principal queens, they actually were did not, you know, they were in Dwarka. They did not as such desire to actually uh, be in that mood of Vrindavan. But it's the fact that the remaining, the sixteen thousand lesser queens, you know, they actually desired to actually. Uh, um, Associate with the form of Krishna in Vrindavan. Sixteen thousand lesser queens. So, Canto uh, ten, chapter eighty-three, text forty-one and forty-three. They actually say, "We desire the same contact with Supreme Lord Lotus Feet that the young woman of Braj, the gopis, you know, actually had that contact. So, we desire that. So, sixteen thousand lesser queens actually had the desire." Of associating with Krishna in Braj. Right? Um, so it is said that these 16,000 queens were stolen from Arjun on the road by Krishna himself in the disguise of cowherd boy. Right? So when it says here, I was actually defeated by a number of infidel cowherd boy, that was actually Krishna himself. And because they had the desire of associating with Krishna in Vrindavan as a cowherd boy, it was Krishna actually who came as a cowherd boy and took these 16,000 uh, queens and gave them his association in Braj. Right? It was called cowherd boy. Right? And, uh, right. and then Arjun was defeated because like, you know, one way is the external story that Arjun had lost his, all his power and hence uh, he could not protect them. But the internal story is actually that this queen desired to associate with Krishna as a Navraj, and hence it was Krishna himself who came and stole the queen. Right? So uh, one layer and then deeper layer. Okay. Okay. Any questions on this? This is clear. Okay. So let's proceed. Text 21. <clears throat> Prachana Mataji. I have the very same Gandiva bow, the same arrows, the same chariot drawn by the same horses, and I use them as the same Arjuna, to whom all the kings offered their the due respects. But in the absence of Lord Krishna, all of them at the moment's notice have become null and void. It is exactly offering clarified butter on ashes, accumulating money with a magic wand, or sowing silks on a barren land. Right. So, you know, think from Arjun's point, like don't go to the internal story right now about how these queens actually desired Krishna and right? but just the outside story about how Arjun was there to protect these queens. Right? He was actually bringing them back to in Hastinapur, right? from Dwarka, he was bringing them back to Hastinapur and then they were actually all stolen. So externally, Arjun is thinking that I could not protect. I had that same Gandiva, the same horses, the same chariot. You know, I have the same strength, but still I was unable to protect all these, uh, these queens of Krishna. Right? So Arjun is lamenting in that way. Prabhupada in the purport makes the point that this is, you know, Krishna in a moment can make everything null and void. Shanina, that word is used. Shanina, in a moment's notice, all our strength and power can be withdrawn. So we already discussed this point. Right? So one should understand. How the world in this world, our, condi our position, our condition is so precarious. At any moment, everything can be taken away. Any moment, our life can be taken away. 
depends on how at every moment it's so important for us to be in the right consciousness you know? at least not go towards the most of passion so that's one okay. and then on the examples are given three examples are given so without krishna is actually saying here uh, just like if there is you know a yagya is going on and the fire is gone and there are only ashes left and you offer ghee nothing will happen right or if someone shows a magic and says here thousand dollar what is the value it is just a magic and then uh, it's just illusion it will go away or if you put some seeds in the barren land all these things have no value similarly in the absence of lord shri krishna everything is actually null and void okay Text 22, 23. O King, since you have asked me about our friends and relatives in the city of Dwarka, I will inform you that all of them were cursed by the Brahmanas, and as a result, they all became intoxicated with wine made of putrefied rice and fought among themselves with sticks, not even recognizing one another. Now all but four or five of them are dead and gone. So Yudhishthira Maharaj had asked in the previous chapter, Oh, what about the residents of Dwarka? You know, Arjuna answered that he said, you know, this story is also there. But then the eleventh canto of Bhagavatam is described how they actually all fought amongst each other. You know, the entire Yadavas they fought with each other. The story, I'm sure you discussed that how uh, you know they went uh, they went to sages. They asked with Chamba. They dressed him like a pregnant woman. They asked, oh, is it a boy or a girl? And the sages, oh, you're joking with us. Whatever will be produced from this. lump will be the cause of destruction of antennas and they had the iron lump and then they took the iron lump to ugrasin and said this is what has happened and uh, they said okay make it into fine powder and put it in the ocean right and they put it, uh, make that iron lump into fine powder put it in the ocean and then there is a story that how they were seeing all inauspicious omens and then krishna actually said you know all these inauspicious things are happening we should go to prabhashetra and do some kind of yagya there for our purification for our protection and they all go to prabhashetra and then there when they are doing yagya you know there were some offerings of uh, this putrified rice and then after the yagya was done they actually took the uh, remnants of uh, offering of putri and they all got intoxicated and then they fought amongst each other and that when the entire yadava dynasty was destroyed okay so the story you know you're familiar this is there in the 11th canto of okay so you say all but four or five are left but everyone is actually taken so okay 24 uh, hari krishna prabhu ji where is prabha kshetra what is that uh, prabha kshetra is uh, from dwarka if you go like towards the ocean there is this place known as prabha kshetra which is actually considered the holy place okay when when krishna was seeing all these inauspicious signs in dwarka they said we should go to prabha kshetra and do a yagya for our protection so they all go on that pretense right but there they have to be a uh, fight amongst each other and kill each other okay thank you 24 so actually this is all due to the supreme will of the lord the personality of god and sometimes people kill one another and at other times they protect one another right so immediately actually this uh, chapter 3 pass stresses on this point that when all the shonakadi rishi are hearing the yadavas they are all eternal associates of the lord how is it that they fought among each other and killed themselves that is like does not even seem like possible right so all these people are actually kind of almost like how how is it possible what 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 is this was happening and then hence few verses here suta goswami is actually clearly making the point that this is all krishna's will right? so he is clearly saying that actually this is all the will of the lord sometimes people kill one another and other times they protect one another so all this is actually happening it is all the arrangements of the lord so 24 if you see it says bhagavata ishwarasya visheshita it is all visheshita the will of bhagavata ishwara krishna himself okay okay next 25 26 okay as in the ocean the bigger and the stronger aquatic swallow up the smaller and the weaker ones so also the supreme personality of god had to lend the burden of the earth has engaged the stronger yadu to kill the weaker and the bigger yadu to kill the smaller right. so again he is actually elaborating on that past and how the yadu kill and the bigger ones kill the smaller the stronger ones kill the weaker and in that way they actually kill 
each other. And he's given the example, just like a big fish and a swallow a small fish. But <clears throat> the point here is, so also the Supreme Personality of God to lighten the burden of the earth. So this is described, uh, elaborated in the 11th canto, how Krishna was actually thinking that all these demons you know, who are actually the real burden for the earth, they have been destroyed. But then he says, what about the burden of the Yadu dynasty? No, one may say the Yadu dynasty, why, are, why is Krishna himself calling them a burden? Yes, the demons are certainly a burden. That we can understand. They're the burden on the earth because they're doing all these nonsense activities. They're drilling holes. They're all demons. So they are the burden. But why is Krishna himself calling his own associates as burden? Because they're, they're strong. Um, probably nobody else can defeat them. Okay, that is a good point. That is a valid point. So Krishna knew they were so strong that no one can defeat them. But why would he say a burden? You know, burden means something that's painful. That's like you know, a burden on the earth. Right? So our uh, Chakrari part explains very nicely. He said there are two kinds of burden. Burden of the beast and burden of love. And he explains so nicely. He says just like when a lady may decorate herself with ornaments. It is weight on her. But the ornaments are a burden of love. You know? And then he explains further and he says, uh, when the husband sits on a young wife, you know, Chakravidapad is always into all this Rasika explanation. But he says, when a husband sits on a young wife, or if a child sits on the lap of a mother, or if there's a lot of wealth for a businessman, all these one way are burdens, right? But that burden is that of love. Okay. So how does, so still we have not explained why Krishna is calling them a burden. And 11 Canto, like our Acharyas go so much into details to explain that. So a little bit uh, I'm just uh, explaining here. And uh, he says, uh, Chakravidipada actually makes a point that, uh, that, you know, when a child is on the lap of a mother, yes, it's a burden, but that burden is a source of pleasure. But then when the child leaves, then the child is actually a burden of separation. So when Krishna is actually saying that uh, the Supreme Personality of God is to lighten the burden of the earth, he's actually saying that when the Yadavas leave, then the earth is going to feel the burden of separation from the Yadavas because they are my own eternal associates. And that's why he's actually referring to the burden. So not burden of the beast, but burden of love. Okay. Um, so when the Lord referred to them in connection with the burden on the earth, he had in mind their imminent disappearance from the earth, right? And uh, when he referred to the unbearable heaviness on the earth in connection with the Yadu dynasty, he was referring to the burden of separation. Like when the Yadus leave, then the earth is going to feel separation. How will the earth uh, you know, take that burden of separation? Okay, so that burden point is there. Is it okay? This point makes sense? Okay. Let's proceed. 27. A very important verse. This is actually a verse from memorization also. Maybe we can do the Sanskrit. They shall be separated. Do the Sanskrit? Yeah. Do the Sanskrit for the Deshakalarta yuktani rittapa pashamani cha haranti smarantashtitam govinda bihitani me. So, this is a verse for memorization. Right? So, that's why we did the Sanskrit. Okay. Uh, go ahead, English. Okay. Translation Now I am attra attracted to those instructions imparted to me by the personality of Godhead Govinda because they are impregnated with instructions for relieving the burning heart in all circumstances of time and space. So up to this point, we have been hearing about Arjun's separation from Krishna, how he is lamenting. Now Krishna has left, right? And now 27, the scene changes, where Arjun is actually now remembering all the instructions of basically Bhagavad Gita. Desha Kalartha, right? Which is actually the instructions that Krishna imparted to Arjun on the battlefield of uh, Kurukshetra, right? It says, uh, uh, which can relieve the burning heart 
in all circumstances of time and space. So desha kalartha you can. So even irrespective of desha and kal, irrespective of where the instruction of Bhagavad Gita is, or irrespective of the time period, these instructions that Krishna gave to Arjun on the battlefield of Kurukshetra are artha, are very important. Right? And this verse really proves the point that Bhagavad Gita is not like someone may say, that was 5,000 years ago. Now it is all, we are all modern. I have my iPhone, I have this. That's not applicable. And this verse from Bhagavatam is clearly making the point. Irrespective of a desh, wherever you are, irrespective of the time period, these instructions are extremely important. And then, what does he say? He says, by remembering smarataha, by remembering these instructions, anyone can actually get free from the burning heart, can get relief from the burning heart. So this material world is a place where there are anxieties at every moment. And one can get free from these anxieties by remembering the instructions of the Gita. And Arjun here is remembering those instructions. And immediately that fear, that uh, pain of separation and lamentation, then actually he's getting some relief from that pain and lamentation. Right? So now this December month is a marathon, Bhagavad Gita marathon month. So we can use this point and tell people that this instruction of Bhagavad Gita 5,000 years ago, still right now, everyone is reading it. People are talking about it, deriving so much inspiration. How wonderful is this message? So you please take a box of Bhagavad Gita, distribute it. You know? So that way we can actually encourage people to share the message of Bhagavad Gita. Okay. Okay. So next section from 28 onwards is we are going to read Arjun's effect by meditating on the message of Bhagavad Gita. Right? So till here everyone is okay? Any questions? Let's proceed to 28. Okay, so 28 to I think next 31, next four verses. One important point we have to really understand up to actually 31. So let's read 28. Ah, Hare Krishna. Uh, Sutta Goswami said, Thus being deeply absorbed in thinking of the instructions of the Lord, which were imparted in the great intimacy of friendship and in thinking of his lotus feet. Arjuna's mind became pacified and free from all material contamination. Hare Krishna. So here uh, Arjuna is chintaya. While he was actually chintaya means thinking. He was thinking of the instructions of Bhagavad Gita, right? Spoken by Krishna. And Krishna path saroruham, right? Krishna path saroruham means again sarora we actually uh, refer to it is resembling the lotus feet. So he was thinking of the instructions of Bhagavad Gita. And by thinking of the instructions, he was meditating on the lotus feet of Krishna, right? Uh, thinking of the lotus feet. Then Arjun's mind became pacified and he actually become, became free of material contamination, right? So what is this uh, uh, material contamination? Right? Did you discuss this point? <clears throat> like particular Sanskrit says, Vimala. Vimala, Mala means actually, you know, dirty things or impurities. Vimala is like, you know, going, uh, giving some special emphasis to that mala, vimala, right? It says that Arjun's vimala or the thing of material contamination was actually pacified. Right? So what was, uh, yeah, and also the word sauhardena by deep friendship, atikadena in great intimacy. So by remembering those instructions, Arjun's mind was pacified and became free of. So, do you discuss this point about what is Arjun's contamination? So, let's go further and come back to this point. This is again like in 29, we hear the same point, and it's important to understand that what is the material contamination? How can Arjun have material contamination? Right? Okay, 29. Arjun's constant remembrance of the lotus feet of Lord Sri Krishna rapidly increased his devotion and as a result all the trash in his thoughts subsided. So it says Vasu Devangri. Angri means lotus feet. Vasu Dev means Krishna. So meditating on the, that constant remembrance, Anudhyana of the lotus feet of Krishna and then 
that is the quality of uh, spiritual remembrance it rapidly increased ramhasa it actually with great velocity it says you know proper translate with great velocity that remembrance of krishna increased in arjun's mind so he was meditating on instructions and he was actually meditating on the lotus feet of krishna so that remembrance of krishna imparting the message of bhagavad gita that actually rapidly increased in his devotion and then again it actually says the ashesha unlimited kashaya dint or oh, sorry uh ashesha yeah unlimited thrash in his thoughts subside and so what is a thrash in arjun's uh mind right you have to understand that. all lamentations uh. okay i'll i'll come to that point and just a moment okay so <clears throat> so also in the purports here proper actually makes a point that how arjun's that separation and lamentation from krishna you know that he was feeling the separation is actually one way transcendental the feeling of separation is undoubtedly painful but because it is in relationship to krishna it is a specific transcendental effect that pacifies the mind so uh, proper is making the point that even the separation that the devotees feel from krishna that is actually transcendent so certainly that separation that arjun was feeling from krishna it cannot be said to be material contamination that vimala the material contamination or the thrash subsided in his mind it cannot be said to be separation that mood of separation because kripa is clearly saying that is actually transcendent and then we actually read further that how the gopis and the devotees of krishna vrindavan they feel that intense separation from krishna but that intense separation is the source of what the highest bliss in uh, spiritual life you know we cannot understand it's like not at a way that you know if someone says why are you practicing krishna consciousness finally we want to want to come to a stage of crying crying and more crying if you say that people will say you are pagal <laughs> they'll run away from you but that crying of the gopis is actually the highest the highest pleasure the highest happiness but how can that crying and lamentation be it is not possible for us to understand but some day as we progress in our bhakti in krishna will redeem those esoteric points to us but we can understand but you know we have to understand that that separation from krishna is actually transcendental properly making that point okay okay <clears throat> now another very practical point is you know when we are in distress we may remember the instructions of bhagavad gita but it should not be just like superficial it should not just be like theoretical that oh i remember this theoretical point here or this you know how arjun's remembrance was that the remembering the instructions increase his devotion to the lotus feet of krishna so remembering the instructions of krishna should be connected with krishna not just like an intellectual exercise a very important point you know intellectually we can understand things in the shastra and when we are distressed we say oh yeah this is this and you know uh, krishna every day he gave how many cows in charity 13084 that's the number given bhagavatam 13084 cows he gave in charity in dwarka every day like you know one could remember technical aspects but one needs to connect it with krishna so that that remembrance is not only intellectual okay? so i'm going to practice okay. now again that vimala and then now the thrash in arjun's mind subsided how do we understand these things right so chakravarti is really you know stressing on this point and he's saying that arjun one way is the eternal associate of krishna so no source that can be no chance of any material contamination first point second if you consider arjun as a amsha of indra because you know like all these eternal associates they also have amsha of the demigods when krishna actually when uh, uh, in ten canto we read when bhumi devi actually with brahma she actually prayed to krishna and krishna told all the demigods you also appear right so it is the eternal associate of krishna with an amsha of the demigods so for arjun the amsha of indra was with him so chakravarti says 
Oh, maybe that refers to the Amsha of Indra. But then he actually says, no, no. Even as an Amsha of Indra, it is not possible that, you know, that Arjun had material contamination because since at the time of birth itself, that pure devotion was there, so that already burned away all material contamination. Now, if we read in this purpose, you will see Prabhupada really stressing the point that Arjun, you know, had something like kind of something material contamination was there and by remembering the instructions, everything washed away. So from Prabhupada's explanation point of view, Prabhupada is seeing how these instructions are practical instructions for us. Mm -hmm. And Prabhupada's explanation, so if you read the purpose, he said that how in this material world we have all these material desires which are a, a cause of all the thrash in our mind and all those things. And all that can be washed away by remembrance of Krishna's instructions of Krishna. So Prabhupada's emphasis on this purpose is on how these instructions are practical to us. So when we have our contamination in our heart can be washed away by remembrance of the instructions of Bhagavad Gita and the Lotus Feet of Krishna. So, Remember this point. Prabhupada's emphasis is on this point. Okay. Now, coming back to the point, what is the contamination? Now we are going one level deeper. right? So the main level that Prabhupada is stressing on is how it is practical to us. Right? So Prabhupada so expertly says, we should remember the instructions. We should meditate on the lotus feet of Krishna. And then the contamination, the vimala in our heart. Right? That's why Prabhupada translates that as material contamination. And then he says, thrash in the heart. That's all applicable to us as conditioned Jiva and all that will be washed away. Right? For now coming back for Arjun, Chakravarti Pad says that Vimala refers to the unsteadiness in Arjun's mind. What is that unsteadiness? Right? So he's actually saying that when here in these verses it says Arjun's mind, like the contamination subsided, is actually referring to Arjun thinking that now Krishna has gone away. While, in actual fact, Krishna is never gone away. Krishna is always there. That appearance and disappearance of Krishna is just like the appearance and disappearance of the sun. When the sun sets in the west, someone is laments, oh, no, sun is gone, sun is dead. It's not true. Sun is still there. It's just not visible to our eyes. So, Chakravati Pad is saying that Arjun's that mood that, oh, now Krishna has left. What will I do? Now, how can I associate with Krishna as a friend? Now Krishna has left. That mood was now washed away. And then Arjun was realizing, no, no, even right now I can associate with Krishna. He's right now. He's here uh, through his instructions, through his words, through his form. He's right here. He's here through his different transcendental capacities. So Arjun realized that by meditating on the instructions. So is this point clear? Like how, you know, that contamination and how do we understand that, right? Okay. So now we can proceed further. Text 30. Hare Krishna. Because of the Lord's pastimes and activities and because of his absence, it appeared that Arjuna forgot the instructions left by the personality of Godhead. But factually, this was not the case. And again, he became Lord of his senses. Hare Krishna. So again, that word Prabhu is actually used. Right? Prabhu means one became the master. So he had, like, you know, if you see, focus on Prabhupada, and Prabhupada is really saying that how he was contaminated. And then, you know, like he's talking for us, how we are contaminated. And then we can, if we actually meditate on the instruction, it appeared that Arjun forgot that. But actually, that was not the case. And again, he became Prabhu, the Lord of the senses. So, text 30, uh, let me see. <clears throat> Right. Actually, uh, here it is saying in text 30, because it says Gitam Bhagavata Jnanam. So one way Gita means also song. So Arjun, after meditating on the instructions of Bhagavad Gita, now he is actually singing those instructions of Bhagavad Gita. So that word Gita is used. So hence it appeared that Arjun had forgotten, but actually he was reciting the nectar of Gita, uh, which actually emanated from the cooling moon-like mouth of Krishna. Right. <clears throat> so, uh, okay, 
And in the purport, Prabhupada actually, he says a wonderful point, text 13. Okay, so in the purport in between, he says, uh, <clears throat> such apparently material activities of Arjun did not drive him away from his transcendental position, but on the contrary, revive his consciousness of the songs of the Lord. Manmana bhava man bhakto man yaji manmanaspuri. So, so Arjun at this point was actually meditating on the instructions, and then he was actually kind of you know, manmana bhava man bhakto. He was completely absorbed in Krishna, and through that, he actually understood that Krishna can never go. He is always here. Right? Just like the sun sets, but the sun is always there, Krishna is always there. So, towards the end of the purport, it says that therefore, after the lost departure, he remained in the same transcendental position, even though it appeared that he had forgotten the instruction. Okay? Then, last sentence of the purport, very nice, very practical. One should therefore adjust the activities of life in pace with the mission of the Lord. And by doing this, one is sure to return back home to God. What does it mean? We adjust our activities in such a way so that we are in tune with the mission of the Lord. What is the mission of the Lord? To reclaim the fall. Back to God. Uh, okay, so I heard to reclaim the fallen souls. Yes, the Lord finally appears to reclaim the fallen souls. So if we actually reorient our life in such a way that we can be instruments to fulfill Lord's mission of reclaiming the fallen souls, then Prabhupada says, then we are sure to go back home. Right? So we should think, why did the Lord come? And what is his mission? How can we be instruments in fulfilling that mission. That's why our aspect of preaching, our whole philosophy, like Prabhupada stressed so much on giving Krishna to others, you know, because that is fulfilling the mission of okay. <clears> the <throat> Text 31. Mm -hmm. Just do a few more verses quickly. Okay. 31. Hare Krishna. Because of his possessing spiritual assets, the doubts of duality were completely cut off. Thus, he was freed from the three modes of material nature and placed in transcendence. There was no longer any chance of his becoming entangled in birth and death, for he was freed from material form. Okay, so uh, there are a few points to discuss here, but I want to see, like, uh, should I stop or should I do a few more verses? Because the text, the section from 40 to 51, that we can go fast. You know, there is not so many points to discuss. It's finally the conclusion where it just said that how, you know, after hearing this whole thing, then Yudhishthir, he decided to go back home, back to Godhead. How did he do that? And then how did the, the remaining brothers followed him? And then how Kunti and then uh, uh, Draupadi and Subhadra, how they attained back to God when they went back to Godhead in the very same body. So that verses are there, 41 to 50, that you can go quickly. But this uh, 31, uh, we stop 31, right? 31 to 40, few points of discussion. Uh, should we do 10 more minutes or should we stop here? We have service for <laughs> <laughs> I would like to stop, but it depends upon everyone. Yeah. Okay, so maybe I feel like maybe we should stop here. I don't want to just rush through the points. So uh, maybe we can do a quick sharing, especially like there were a few points in the second part where uh, Arjun's contamination, you know, all those things. So if uh, if you can just quickly revise that so that those points are clear, you know, the last section or anything from today's, let's if you can, uh, everyone can quickly share their realizations, then it'll be a good revision. <coughs> Um, Prabhuji, I feel that this uh, this chapter, 15 chapter itself, very much relates to me because uh, whenever I feel sad or um, lost, right, I can immediately uh, pick up Bhagavad Gita or Bhagavatam and uh, listen to instructions that Krishna has given. Right? Just like Arjun was lamenting so much that, oh, Krishna, I can't see Krishna anymore. But then when he remembers Krishna's instructions in Bhagavad Gita, he was pacified. That's, that's a very, very like key essential point, very practical point. For this very nice. Thank you. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Prabhuji, I have one question. So, like uh, the queens of uh, Dwarka, so they were uh, initially when they were the princes, that time also they were kidnapped by the demon and then uh, Krishna saved them and the second time also they were kidnapped but this time they were kidnapped by Krishna Guruji. Yes. Yeah. So twice they were kidnapped, right? Yeah. First time they were kidnapped and they prayed to Krishna and then Krishna saved them. He saved them. Yeah. them with, uh, all of them as his own wife, 16,000 wives. The second time is more a deeper reason that because they wanted to associate Krishna as a cowherd boy, all those cowherd boys came and kidnapped them. But that was basically Krishna taking them back to Raja because they had that desire. So, uh, Canto 10, 83, the last three verses mm -hmm. where they express their desire and they are talking to Draupadi actually. And they express their desire how they want to be the gopis of Vrindavan. And so, Krishna fulfilled that desire in the second day. I think a related point on that one also is Prabhuji in uh, the 10th canto, 22nd chapter, 4th verse is where gopis are praying to Kathyani Devi to become wives of the Lord. Mm. It's also explained that uh, Krishna fulfilled that desire that they became the queens. Mm. But then at this, he wanted to unwind that past time and bring them as gopis back. Wow. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Thank you for connecting that whole, completing that whole thing. Hare Krishna, Guruji. Um, it's like uh, how to go, go back to Godhead is to adjust the activities of the life in uh, tune with the mission of the Lord. Um, that was very really powerful. That's a nice point. Like you can meditate. What, why does the Lord come again and again? And again? What is the main reason? Right? I need to reclaim for the mind. How can I be an instrument? Nimitta Matra. Be an instrument in the Lord's mission. Then my life will be Hare Krishna Prabhuji. In a text, uh, I think 20 or 21, the Astavakra Muni story. Mm -hmm. So, like uh, every action has like a reaction. So, we should not make any fun, or uh, that is the application point for mm -hmm. me, I mean, yes. for us. We don't actually, you know, see people from the external point of view. Yes. Prabhuji, one thing for me is everything happens by the will of the Lord, God. So constant reminder, don't get, you know, uh, excited or upset about anything. Everything happens by the will of God. Again, it's said. To see Krishna's hand in every situation and to see how every situation can be an impetus to remember Krishna. Yeah. The both these points, yes. You see Krishna's hand in everything and seeing how every situation is impetus to really think about Krishna, you know, increase our intensity. And especially the last part of this chapter, so wonderful because it talks of their final, you know, winding of their pastimes and then going back home back to Godhead. And how and I'll come to those points later in next time session, uh, how it is so practical to us to prepare our consciousness for the final exam. Very wonderful points. So we'll come to that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. I really like that point uh, that uh, Srimad Bhagavad and Bhagavad Gita, all these instructions will wash away all our contamination. Yeah. And Prabhupada, really, in the purports, if you read, Prabhupada is really stressing his pointing out what is all our anarthas, our, our vimala, our trash in our mind. And says all that trash is actually all the material desires that we have accumulated for so many lifetimes. That is all the trash which is actually there in our mind. And so we have to be washed by these instructions of the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada Vimala is actually translated as without any contamination. Is the contamination word Amla? It's the same word Amala and Vimala, right? No, the meaning Vimala like is translated as without any. Okay, okay. Page uh, 788. Okay, yeah, yeah. So basically it is saying that he became Vimala after remembering the instructions of Bhagavad Gita. That means he had that mala. He had that contamination and that contamination got purified by remembering the instructions. Okay. Vimala. 
Arjun's free of that. He, the, Arjun's mind became pacified and free of all material contamination. Prabhupada explains in the translation. And so the material contaminations is that mala in the heart and he became free mala. What was someone who was saying something else? Hare Krishna Prabhu Ji. Yeah, that's why it says Srimad Bhagavatam is Amala Purana. Say, no, no one, there is no one. <laughs> Okay. Someone else said uh, Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Um, so my practical realization was uh, like we had like like last three sessions of this same chapter reading, but when you brought out so many you know nice points and you know the mood, uh, you know, I it would shows the purpose of the guru and you know, <laughs> you know like reading in um in association and you know who has already gone through. So you know. Um, I really understood the importance of, you know, we have the books, but still, you know, a uh, no person who is guiding us. Uh, no, uh, I am I am just repeating what I have heard from uh, my teachers and my gurus, just uh, trying to be an instrument. But uh, I'm happy that you all, you know, can go deep and relish this nectar of the Bhagavad Gita. That's like our whole purpose of life. Just if you can, you know, how we read... <clears throat> Uh, Bhagavata Rasam Alayam, right? It actually says that how we should drink the, how Chakravati Path says, we drink the nectar of Bhagavata, we become intoxicated, we faint, we get up, and we drink the nectar, we get intoxicated, we faint, again we get up, we drink the nectar, that is our life. <laughs> so actually, oh yeah, the other point that I was going to mention that in relation to Vimala, that we have to wash our consciousness with the instructions of Bhagavad Gita and Sri Bhagavatam, right? And which is that verse that comes to our mind when we think of that washing our consciousness? Famous verse, second chapter, first canto. <laughs> Yes, Ridayantastu hi Abhadrani Vidunoti Right? So when we bathe our consciousness with the instructions of Bhagavad Gita, then who does the washing of consciousness? Krishna himself, who is in our heart as Paramatma, he washes away our consciousness. So all that contamination can be washed away by us taking to the instructions of Bhagavad Gita and Shri Bhagavad Gita. Anything else? So next time, like I feel, uh, you know, uh, maybe just one hour. I feel we can finish this chapter and we'll move on to the next chapter. Okay. Next time it will be ending of chapter fifteen and we we'll move to chapter sixteen. Okay, Devinder you Mahi, you're saying something. We cannot hear you, Mahi. We cannot hear you. You are unmute, but still we cannot hear you. It was okay before. Let's see your mic or something. Okay. And then you can type in, in the box. If you have. Okay. Anything else? Anyone? Okay. So we'll stop here. Right. Any uh, other practical point about the uh, exam essay? But you know, now on, let's uh, keep the continuity. I, I know there was, you know, I was out for some time, but we'll continue and then we'll finish our first canto, we'll finish this uh, module two, and, you know, keep up with all the exams, essays. Let's keep everything back on track. Right? So, uh, 19 till chapter 19. Right? So, another uh, three more chapters, you know, 16, four more chapters, we'll complete canto one. So, that will be module two. Right? So thank you all so much. We'll stop here. Karantara Shriman Bhagavatam ki jai Shila Prabhupada ki jai Vancha Kalpataru Jasi Prakasindu Gurevacha Patitanam Bhavanindu Vaishnavi Gurevacha Karantara Prabhupada ki Nantakoti Vaishnavi Thank you all so much for your association. Thank you for joining. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhuji Hare Krishna. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhuji.